Good morning. This is a courtesy announcement that our meeting is now live on YouTube.
Will the captioner please run a test? Will the captioner please run a captions test? We do see captions, thank you. Good morning, it is 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday, March 26th, and I am calling to order this uh, regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Let's begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Smidian? Vice President Lee? Good morning, President. President Ellenberg? I'm here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, not part of the roll call, but I am gonna call out our county executive, James Williams, because today is his 40th birthday. So happy wow. birthday, James. <laughs> happy birthday. And yes, that is shocking. <laughs> um, so why don't you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today? I will try to give you an efficient and well-managed meeting for your birthday present. It is my uh, honor this morning to, um, to introduce Danielle Villalobos, who will be our inv invocator. Um, we are just days ahead of Transgender Visibility Day, which is observed annually on March 31st. Danielle serves as the marketing and outreach specialist for Silicon Valley Pride, where she champions LGBTQ plus rights. Today, she, joins, she will join us to share her thoughts regarding the significance of Transgender Day of Visibility. This is a day dedicated to celebrating the courage, determination, and resilience of our transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming community members. These are individuals who deserve to be recognized, listened to and valued. In recent times, we've witnessed inspiring strides of members of the transgender community, gracing the covers of magazines, creating music, serving in public office, and more. These achievements exist, coexist, alongside the challenges the trans community still faces, including discrimination and violence. On March 31st, before and after, I ask that we all commit to honoring their journey, celebrating their accomplishments, and reaffirming our commitment to fostering a world where everyone can live authentically and without fear. Danielle, welcome. Go to the podium. The microphone is built into the podium. Oh, awesome. Love technology. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my fellow dear supervisors, and thank you for having me here today. And thank you, President Allenberg and Chief of Staff for giving me a place to share my voice on such an important day for my community. My name is Danny Villalobos, she, her. I am honored and privileged to speak on behalf of my fellow brothers, sisters, and siblings from the community that has been most misunderstood and misrepresented. <clears throat> today, the day of trans, or the Day of Transgender Day of Visibility, we pay our respect to millions of transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive Americans, conveying the message that we see them, that they belong, and that at the end of the day, they are treated with dignity and respect. Santa Clara County is and continues to be a safe space and a safe haven for folks wanting to live their true and authentic selves without fear. I wanna focus on the word visibility because to those that haven't lived 
through those experiences might not understand what it means to be visible or rather invisible. When I started working for Santa Clara County at Valley Health Plan back in 2017, I was only 24 years old and I was at the point of my transition where no one knew on my past identity. I was Danny with an eye, I was fabulous and motivated and ready to take on the world, but most of all, I was, happy to work, I was happy to be working for Santa Clara County as an employee with a prestigious title and great retirement benefits. However, a year into my career working at VHP, I was having lunch with a coworker and I came out to her as trans. At the time, the only person that knew about my trans identity was my manager. My coworker confessed that she had already known that I was trans. She also confessed that when she began working for VHP, there was an employee working in the admin department that was talking about me to other former employees about how I changed my legal name from the court order documents that I handed to her at the beginning of the year. The employee handling my paperwork thought it was weird that I was getting a name change and proceeded to talk about my confidential paperwork to other employees and make nasty comments without me even knowing about it for months. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, how someone entrusted, so, entrusted to handle confidential information would do something like that. I felt as though my safety and trust had been violated. When I, when I returned to the office that day, I began to cry at my desk. And then I felt afraid. I didn't want my coworkers to see me cry, so I went into a closet. I closed the door behind me and I just cried. In that moment, I started to think, what happened to Gwen Araujo, a trans woman who was murdered in New York back in 2002 by three boys her age when they found out that she was also trans. I couldn't get the image of Gwen out of my head and so I just sat there on the floor and I continued to cry. I felt violated and betrayed having someone reveal my story, my identity without me, without giving me the freedom to come out myself. I chose to live in privacy not telling people that I was trans because I was afraid. Look at what happened to Gwen. She was murdered for not telling people about her true identity. A year later, justice was served. I asked the investigator from Equal Opportunity for two things. One, that the employee that outed me was not fired but displaced to another department because at the end of the day, I still had compassion over the fact that she was still a single mother working to feed her children. And two, that the county created more impactful trainings about tolerance and acceptance of the LGBTQ community especially the transgender and gender expansive community, because I didn't want the same thing to happen to me to happen to somebody else. Privacy and respect is an employee's most basic right, especially working in one of the most respected workplaces in the county. But when someone chooses to use that trust and power for an imprudent act, and when the job of the department that is supposed to protect their employees is ill-informed on the laws that protect our people, then we all lose, not just trust, but our sense of faith too. The word transgender can be a dangerous for, some, for someone choosing to live their authentic selves, especially when existing outside of these four, four walls of the county. That is just the reality of people like me living in fear, not knowing what people that lack empathy and humanity are capable of. To this day, I hesitate to disclose who I really am in certain spaces to certain individuals fearing that the name too will end up on the human rights campaign list of transgender deaths in America. However, today, however, Transgender Day of Visibility is to remind me that I am grateful to be standing in front of you, living my authentic self. With the support of my friends, colleagues, and family, and work, I am working towards my goals and the dreams that I've always had. Being able to live a life how I choose to live it is such a privilege. I am glad to be here in Santa Clara County, and I'm seen, and I'm heard, and I'm loved. As I continue my journey, I think I give thanks that when, as I continue my journey, I give thanks on a day like this for those that have fought for me and for the laws that protect me. Today is a day where Trans Day of Visibility is a day where we give visibility to people in my community that are invisible because unfortunately, sometimes they have to be. And we give love and support for the brave individuals that live authentically and courageously, hoping that by speaking their true authentic selves, someone will listen, but most importantly, someone will see us, all of us, even the invisible ones. Thank you.
Danny, thank you so much for your beautiful uh, words inspiring us all to be our best selves and as the fourth largest employer in Santa Clara County for every single one of us to hear that we are seen and valued and protected. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of adjournments in memoriam today. Uh, the first one is going to be presented in honor and memory of Don's son by Supervisors Chavez and Lee. Thank you, President Ellenberg. And thank you, colleagues, for allowing this honor today. Today, we adjourn in memory of Don's son. Don graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1990 with a master's degree in economics and did a research fellowship at Stanford's Hoover, Hoover Institute from 1990 to 93, researching political and land reform in Taiwan. He served as president of the Bay Area chapter of Asian Pacific Islander Public Affairs, um, also known as APAPU. He was also actively involved in the Cupertino Rotary Club for nearly two decades. Aside from his contributions to Bay Area local politics, his impact reached na nationwide with substantial amounts of fundraising um, he did for hundreds of promising Asian American candidates, including Andrew Yang, Judy Chu, Ted Liu, Ro Khanna, Grace Meng, and many others. In addition to supporting Asian American candidates, Don was vocal about the treatment of Asian Americans leading advocacy efforts towards securing a formal apology from the US House of Representatives for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and leading opposition to California's Senatorial Constitution Amendment 5. Don loved golfing, traveling, chocolate, and reading. And he, um, for many of us um, here, we knew him from many, many different places. I never went anywhere with Don where he didn't run into someone he knew. I mean, really, literally, whether it was a restaurant, uh, um, an event, uh, uh, you know, golfing, it just didn't matter. He knew somebody. And I'm really honored that his two sons are here with us today, Chris and Anthony, and his goddaughter, Yi Yan Shri. You know, Don was smart, loving, kind, energetic, and he looked at other people as an opportunity to, to be the bridge himself between communities and cultures. And he spent a lot of time doing that. And I don't need to tell you that he was just a lot of fun to be around. High energy and um, and just really positive. You know, he he and he gave advice in a way that didn't make you feel like um, he was disrespecting you, but really trying to support and, and love you. Um, so I'm so honored that you're here, and I know we're gonna hear from you in a moment, but I'm adjourning this meeting in his honor in partnership with my colleague, Supervisor Otto Lee, so I'd like Otto to say a few words. Thank you, Supervisor, for bringing uh, this adjournment forward. Uh, our dear friend John Don has been a passionate political activist. He graduated from the Chinese University of China, came to the U.S. in 88, lived in Cupertino, served as planning commissioner. And as Supervisor Chavez has noted, he was also director of the AAPI Fund Development for Andrew Yang's Humanity Forward Movement in 2020. In this role, he organized rallies for API community in over 20 cities across the United States and completed over 30 fundraisers with achieving a 100% goal. He also served as executive director of the Asian Americans for Good Government, AAGG PAC, and also a publisher and the CEO of the Chinese American Youth Community Leadership Institute. Um, he worked to create summer camp for youth to engage in civil, civic and political campaign training he truly understands the importance of voting and getting API to register to vote. His omnipresence in our community will be a huge loss. He's literally everywhere and is involved in so many great causes serving Asian American communities. I turn around, I always see him working on something else and I'm really honored to have known him all these years, the last, I would say, close to 20 years. And our thoughts go out to his family. Uh, his families, I believe, are here. And please come up to say a few words. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris, the eldest son of Don's son. 
First off, I'd like to thank everyone in attendance for contributing part of their busy day to honor Don. Growing up, I watched my father give himself endlessly to his community. I never understood why, but as I grew older and began to assist during his events, I began understanding his strong desires to better all communities. He understood that one must take action for the change they, want, they wish to implement. I may not be able to step in his shoes at this moment, but he has inspired me and many others to want to give back to society. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for being here today, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And may Don's memory be for a blessing to all of you who knew and loved him. Uh, our next adjournment uh, will oh, be. One more. Oh, this side. Welcome. Hi, my name's Ian. It has been my great pleasure to be here as Don's goddaughter and his assistant to express my profound gratitude to Supervisor Sunny Chavez and Otto Lee for extending their heartfelt condolences to Don and his surviving family. Don has been a dear mentor, a loving father figure, and a great source of inspiration and support to me since I was a student in Columbia. He sincerely embraced a young girl's passion for democracy and good governance, fostering my growth and dedication to serving society, especially Asian American communities, through my involvement of assisting him in political campaigns and community service endeavors. Let us carry forth Don's spirit of resilience, compassion, unwavering commitment to justice, making his impact continue to illuminate and motivate generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with a heavy heart, we also adjourn today in honor and memory of Navy Captain Dean Tan Tran. Navy Captain Dean, as I call him, is a community activist and well-known leader in the Vietnamese American community, has passed away on March 8, 2024 in his home in Santa Clara County. He was born on November 18, 1938 in Soc Trang, Vietnam. 1962 is when he graduated from the Vietnam's Naval Academy, Class 10, and served on the gunboat HQ-327. In 1964, he studied transportation and traffic management and graduated from the U.S. Naval School right here in Oakland, California. And then he went back to Vietnam to serve as a transportation officer at the Navy headquarters. In 1967, he was promoted to be the commanding officer of the 28th River Assault Division. From 68 to 70, he served as a Navy aide to the President of the Republic of Vietnam, Nguyen Van Trung. In 1970, he went to the U.S. to take a senior officer intelligence course and completed at the U.S. Army Intelligence Schools here at Fort Holabird in Baltimore, Maryland. In 1975, he was promoted to the rank of Navy Captain, which is equivalent to an Army Colonel, as a Chief of Security for the Republic of Vietnam under President Nguyen Van Tro. After the fall of Saigon, he went to the U.S. finally in 1983 and served as Director of Security, Operation, and Training for the 8th Special Support a support group. In 87 89, he was Deputy Chief of Staff for the Civil Military Operations, North America Command, California State Military Reserve. Within the Vietnamese American community, he is everywhere. He served as advisor to support the former South Vietnam Armed Forces Alliance from 1994 until his passing. Captain Dean was also the president of the Vietnamese Virtual Assistance Fund which helps family of each member taking care of themselves after the loved one passes away. And he also serves as the president of Sok Tran province. We are tremendously saddened to lose such a great leader, a true giant in our community. My sincere condolences to his family. And I just had lunch with him less than two months ago. When he presented, he made sure that he personally was there to present a martial arts certificate to my staff member, Tebu, and really shows how much he cares about everybody and that he still serves every single day to his very end. Today, many of his children's friends and community members are here, and yes, you could see. And I'll ask you to stand to show 
your support for him. Wow. If you are a friend of his. And I would like to also invite Mrs. Tru Jiang, uh, daughter, and Fu Lei from the Navy family to come up and say a few words, please. Right to the podium, please. Thank you and welcome. And I have my own speech. Um, do I stand here? Okay. No, hold up. Good night. Good morning. Thank you so much, Supervisor Otterly, for organizing this special event in honor of my father, Dan Tran, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I wanna share a short story about the last part of my dad's life. He always does the best he can for his family. He goes back to Vietnam often to visit. He makes sure his ancestor home is in good condition. He makes sure his parent grave are well maintained. He even prepare a tombstone with the name of all his siblings, including his own name and my late his own name and my late mother. Recently, his health has been declining, but he still wanted to visit Vietnam one last time. I was very worried and asked that what if something happened to you over there? He was very calm and told me he was prepared for all circumstances. I saw him the night before he left to Vietnam. As we say goodbye to each other at the doorway, I hugged and kissed him. I walk out that door and find myself running back to my father and kiss him and hug him again. I wanted to cry and I told him, what if I don't see you again? But he looked at me calmly and just smiled. So I walk home through the hallway feeling very sad. He made it to Vietnam on the 22nd of February. It was a three week vacation and he visited two out of three weeks there. He enjoyed Viet food very much. He even went from the south all the way to the north to visit some more family member from my mom's side. And I spoke to him very often and the last time I spoke to him was the, the, the night in California, so that's daytime over there, um, Friday, um, March 8th over there and March 7th for us. And I got to look at my father's face for the very last time. And he looked, I complimented him. His skin looks really nice and moist because the, the weather over there is humid. And then, and he looked very calm and relaxed. And the next two hours, I got a phone call from one of his niece. And she told me to be calm because my dad just had passed away. I was very, very shocked and devastated. And the story was he went to lie down that morning, one hour after he talked to me, and he just, raised his arm up and, and look up like somebody was lifting him up to heaven and then he just passed away really quick. It took me many days to process what happened to him and then finally I have to accept his passing. I think my father really wanted to die in his home where he was born and his spirit agreed with him. I want to thank my dad for all the love he gave us and the beautiful memory that we share. He was like the roof of my home. I will forever miss him until we meet again. And I'd like to speak a little bit Vietnamese for his friend. Trước hết, thay mặt gia đình đại tá, hải quân điền và hội, hải quân bạch đằng, cháu xin gửi lời cảm ơn đến các Giám sát viên và nhân viên thành phố đã tổ chức buổi lễ tôn vinh và tưởng nhớ đến ba cháu đại tá Hải quân Trần Thanh Điền. Ba cháu là một nhà lãnh đạo tài ba và dung cảm. Ông rất điềm tĩnh, dễ gần. 
nhưng rất cứng rắn và có quan điểm vững vàng về sự sống, cái chết và những đề quan trọng. Trước khi trở thành người đứng đầu đội cận vệ của Tổng thống Thiệu, ông chỉ huy các giai đoàn xung kích và pháo hạm. Anh có nhiều huy chương quốc gia, ông để lại hai đứa con và vài đứa cháu sống ở San Jose. Mọi người ở Việt Nam rất yêu ông Điền và nhớ ông rất lâu. Một lần nữa xin cảm ơn các giám sát đã dành thời gian để tôn vinh và tưởng nhớ ông. Thank you. Thank you very much. Come on. May I just, I, yeah, thank you. I, I want to say thank you to all of you um, for coming and uh, Supervisor Lee for making sure that we, that we honored um, Captain Dan. And I, I wanted to say to all of the community that, you know, he was a role model and a leader and we're so grateful that he served all of our community. Thank you. Supervisor Smithia. On this next item, thank you. Oh, okay. Anything on, on this item, Supervisor Ernest? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, item 4C um, is an adjournment in memory of Eileen Hamper. Um, and it's my, my honor to offer these words. Recently, Santa Clara County lost a beloved member of the LGBTQ plus community, Eileen Hamper. I'm actually just going to wait for a, a moment. We do have two more adjournments. I'm going to ask if, if folks are interested in, in uh, remaining, that we, we sit and offer uh, the same respect to our additional adjournments. If, if it's time to leave, that's, that's absolutely fine. We'll just pause while, while people have a moment to file out. Thanks so much. I'm going to ask if you're standing and heading out that you, that you move through the doors promptly so that we can continue our meeting. Thanks so much. All right. Recently, Santa Clara County lost a beloved member of the LGBTQ plus community, Eileen Hamper. Eileen was recently diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer, which came as a terrible shock to her friends and families, and she passed away shortly after the news of her illness. She leaves behind a legacy of enthusiastic involvement in multiple LGBTQ plus organizations, a memory of her beautiful smile, and the love she shared with Betty Owen as an extraordinary partner. Eileen's commitment to the LGBTQ plus community was profound. Her efforts included 25 years on the Rainbow Women's Chorus, membership in the Rainbow Chamber of Commerce of Silicon Valley, in which she lovingly supported her wife Betty as the president of the Rainbow Chamber, her involvement with the Baymac Community Foundation, 
the RWC <laughs> Circle Action, and as a volunteer at the Billy DeFrank Center. Beyond her activism, Eileen had so many passions and interests. She loved science and dogs and camping. She embraced the arts through playing the ukulele, painting, and creating art. Eileen's absence leaves a void in the hearts of those who knew her, and she will be deeply missed. I believe her spirit and the impact of her work will continue to inspire and resonate within the community, and her legacy of love, advocacy, and passion will live on. Is Betty here? Thank you. Hi, Betty. Thank you very much for recognizing Eileen. I feel like the, the thing about Eileen is that she demonstrates the power, the extreme power of the introvert, <laughs> because she was an introverted person, but she supported so many ro roles. And we had a joke at the house. She would give to any whale that swam past the door. So she <laughs> gave to many, many causes, and uh, she used to do little uh, fix-it jobs for people after she retired, and if they gave her money, she would give it away, so that was her. But just two very quick things that I thought illustrated her. I got a card <coughs> while she was sick or from an old friend we hadn't seen in many years, and she told me that years ago uh, she was in some financial straits. This was even before I knew Eileen, and, and she was hesitant to borrow some money from Eileen, and Eileen said, no. She goes, I have a way to handle this. I'll buy your car for $1,000, but you don't need to give me the car. And it was because she didn't believe in loaning money. She always just believed you just give it and forget it. And uh, that was the story. And then the last thing I want to say was that when she was in the hospital and we got this diagnosis, which was, you know, a kind of a shock, and <coughs> first they tell you, and then the next day they send a different doctor in to ask you, what you want to do. And she said, I don't want treatment. I want to go home. And we talked about that and everything. But then she said, he said, do you have one more question? Any more questions? And she said, yes. And she said, how do you, having had to do this for so many years, how does it feel to come in and tell people that they're going to lose their life or that they're, you know, they have a short time to live? And he was so startled. He said, in 20 years, I've never had a patient ask me anything like that. And he sat and talked to us for a while. And I felt it epitomized her deep concern for other people and her generosity. And um, we will all miss her greatly. And thank you very much. Thank you for being with us, um, Betty. Uh, May Eileen's memory continue to be a blessing for everyone who knew her and loved her. Our final adjournment this morning uh, will be offered in honor and memory of Paul Sakamoto from Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President and members. It's my privilege today to ask that we adjourn in memory of Paul Sakamoto. Uh, Paul. <coughs> Paul passed away this fall uh, at the age of 89 here in his hometown after a challenging struggle with Parkinson's. Uh, I knew Paul first and best as a very highly regarded educator here in our county, uh, but he was also an artist and a horticulturalist as anyone who got to know him would uh, quickly discern. He was, um, Paul was the youngest of 11 children, born uh, February 3rd, 1934, uh, in a boarding house at uh, 5th and Jackson uh, here in San Jose's Japantown. His, uh, his dad was a farmer, and uh, mom and the kids helped with the farming uh, during harvest time. And um, an all-too-common story during World War II, the Sakamoto family was uprooted and incarcerated at Jerome, Arkansas one of the 10 American camps that imprisoned 120,000 individuals of Japanese ancestry, the majority of whom were, of course, American-born citizens. After the war, the family, the Sakamoto family, returned to San Jose, worked in strawberry farming, and Paul went to public schools. More on that in a moment. Um, he then went to San Jose State. He was 
active as a student leader, got both his bachelor's and master's degree uh, at San Jose State. Uh, went on to Michigan State uh, eventually, where he received a PhD in educational administration and came home to Santa Clara County and to his roots. Uh, he was a teacher uh, at Sunnyvale High, uh, later became a principal, and uh, eventually as the superintendent of schools at the Mountain View Los Altos High School District, which is how I came to know him some years ago. Uh, he was a founding member of Asian Americans for Community Involvement, ACI, uh, which was established in 1973 and remained involved with the organization throughout his entire life. And in fact, the last time I saw Paul was at the 50th celebration uh, we hosted for, 50th anniversary celebration we hosted for Aki's founders, a number of whom uh, fortunately were able to, to join us. Um, his published obituary uh, described Paul as, and I wanna read the language directly here, one of the kindest and most thoughtful, gentle souls you will ever know. I think that um, certainly is accurate, consistent with everything I ever saw. But the word that um, I thought sums, sums up the way Paul went through life, most fully and appropriately, uh, is dignity. I, I never saw a moment where Paul Sakamoto carried himself with anything less than absolute dignity, and in so doing, frankly, brought dignity to any place or occasion where he was present and uh, summoned up a measure of dignity in others who um, were in his presence. Uh, he, after retirement, uh, devoted himself more fully to his art and his horticulture. Uh, plants and art were uh, kind of the, the thing that you knew about Paul and his passions. Uh, if you got to know him, he in fact uh, established Sakamoto plants in uh, Los Gatos. Uh, his pen and ink drawings were um, highly regarded and um, often shared with the various charitable causes and organizations in Japantown uh, to which he was devoted. Uh, to sort of further emphasize the local connection, when uh, Paul closed his nursery, he donated many of the very precious plants and cherry blossom trees uh, from his uh, operation to Hakone Gardens in uh, Saratoga. And um, I thought the comment from his longtime friend uh, and historian, Connie Young Yu, uh, was uh, absolutely uh, spot on when she observed that everywhere Paul went, he changed the landscape. And with that said, let me turn to Supervisor Lee, who I know also has some thoughts to share today. First of all, thank you, uh, Supervisor Minion, for bringing this forward. And um, Paul was born and raised in the farmlands of Alviso, right here in uh, our District 3. Uh, even though his family was sent to internment camp, just like so many, uh, like our former Secretary Norman Netta, Secretary of Tra Transportation, our mayor, right here in San Jose, uh, they have to suffer through the indignities forcing being sold, uh, forced to sell the family properties. Uh, but even though all that, able to come back to San Jose to restart his life. He has mentored so many future civic leaders by, you know, and then of course the founding of the Aki, Asian Americans for Community Involvement, is really uh, tremendous. Aki is currently one of our most important providers of healthcare and so many service to not just Asian American community, but for everybody right here in Santa Clara County. And if we're not for his leadership, you know, Aki wouldn't be here and people like me will not even be right here serving on this board. So I just want to say thank you again, Paul, for everything you've done. It's truly a great loss and huge condolences and sorry for the family. Thank you. Thank you all. I know the adjournments are inherently sad and difficult moments, but there is such a, a beauty as well in being able to share life stories in this very public chamber, in this very, um, I think, significant and, and um, honoring environment. So 
I'm glad that we, that we take opportunities to do that, so with thanks to my colleagues. Item five is, a com is for commendations and proclamations, and we have one of each today, uh, both of which will be presented by Supervisor Arenas. So I will turn to you for uh, National Farm Worker Awareness Week and the commendation for Dr. Francisco Jimenez. Good morning, everyone. I have the distinct honor of um, introducing an award-winning author and world-renowned academic, Dr. Francisco Jimenez, who asked me to call him Francisco this morning. I said, never. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Um, Jimenez, thank you for being in our house this morning. Um, and thank you for offering all that you have throughout your career and your life um, to all of us. And I'm going to share a little bit about who you are with the rest of the folks who are here who have not maybe heard of you for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> um, but your books and your work and your recent film are just um, absolutely fabulous and, and um, to be explored. So I encourage everybody to, to look up um, Dr. Jimenez and my colleagues behind me have a copy of um, the circuit or breaking through um, one of your, uh, I don't know if both of the books, but at least one of those books and I signed by your, yourself. So Dr. Uh, Jimenez serves as a professor emeritus in the department of modern languages and literature at Santa Clara University and whose books have been critically acclaimed for celebrating Mexican and Mexican American literature and heritage. Um, he immigrated with his family from Tlaquepaque, uh, Jalisco, Mexico in 1949. And as a child, he worked alongside his parents in the agricultural fields of California, which later inspired numerous award-winning books based on his memoirs as a migrant farm worker. Recently, I was able to watch Unbroken Sky, the film um, in South County, and it inspired me to also retell my own immigrant story, which is a very poignant in terms of what you encourage all of us to do by telling your own. Um, Dr. Jimenez's autobiographical books have been published in over six different languages and over 100 different textbooks, winning 10 national literary awards, including the prestigious John Steinbeck Award, the Beatty Award, and the Luis Leal Award for distinction in Chicano Latino literature. Once again, please look up his books, Breaking Through and The Circuit. Um, Casas de Carton, so many more, and I know that many of you here have heard of him and ad have admired his, his work, um, and, it, and I don't need to tell you about it, but I will, and <laughs> I will continue to do this because his books humanize all of us and our immigrant stories, which I recently, my, my son had this paper about immigrants and, um, and how media, and recently, well, like throughout the whole uh, history of our country, immigrants have been viewed in a negative form. And it's up to all of us, especially leaders and writers, um, and, and like you, Dr. Jimenez, to really change the narrative about who immigrants are. And um, because words are so important, and the portrayal of who we are is so important to continue to tell folks um, and one of the things that my, uh, my son and I agreed on was that we would inter-exchange immigrant with refugees of poverty. Because that's really what, when it comes down to it, our, our families are all moved to leave their um, home country to look for more opportunities in this country. And we have to make sure that we continue to tell who we are and his recent books and recent film, Broken, Unbroken Sky, tell us your story as a child of 
migrant workers of a bracero, and I just saw myself in that so much. I didn't get to work in in the fields like my older brothers, my older brother and sisters, but I know those stories very well. And I'm grateful to you that you continue to portray all of us in such a dignified and truthful <coughs> manner and for encouraging all of us to tell our own stories. So it's not only fitting that today we have the National Farm Worker Awareness Week, and we're also later on in this meeting, Dr. Jimenez, we're going to hear an update about agriculture farm worker housing from Silvia Gallegos um, and a, a potential uh, statewide uh, legislation update to um, Speaker Rivas's uh, bill. And right now I can't remember the bill <laughs> number, but there's a lot of really wonderful work, work being done in this county towards far, um, to support farm workers and continue to support them and live in a dignified way within our community. And so as a daughter of a bracero, as a daughter of an immigrant, of a refugee of poverty, I thank you for all the work that you've done to continue to manifest this American dream in a way um, that we can all share in the experience through your books, through the film that is based on your book, Unbroken Sky, and for all the work that you have done to remind us what really the immigrant story is all about that in that we are refugees of poverty but we are champions in this country in the many different fields that we excel in um, and so thank you so much I, I would love to have you up here and and your wife as well if if she so wishes to join us and I'd like to not only present you with a commendation to proclaim National Farm Worker Awareness. And if I had that commendation. <laughs> <laughs> These are really heavy, so it's arm day today. Um, this is a commendation for you, Dr. Jimenez, for all the work that you've done. And then this is also for you to help us proclaim National Farm Worker Awareness Week. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done um, and for, you can manage, uh, yes, of course you can manage. <laughs> um, and I would like to invite you to say um, a couple of words, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Arenas, for this wonderful introduction. And I, I thank the members of the uh, Board of Supervisors for this honor. Uh, this recognition, as Mrs. Arenas has indicated, belongs to all farm workers who toil in the fields, seeking a, a new and better life for their children. Farm workers inspire my writing and they inspire me personally. For example, I wrote the first book, The Circuit Stories from the Life of a Migrant Child, to chronicle part of my family's history, but more importantly, to document the experiences of many farm workers from the past and the present whose hard and noble work puts food on our tables. Their courage and struggles, hopes and dreams for a better life for their children and their children's children give meaning to the term the American dream. Their story is an important and integral part of the American's story. It is your story, our story. And so it's Wonderful that they, all farm workers, are being honored today. For this reason, I also am thankful that the film, The Unbroken Sky, which is based on my memoirs, was produced to honor immigrants and farm workers. And my hope 
is that viewers of the unbroken sky and readers of my work will deepen their empathy, respect, and appreciation for farm workers whose valuable contributions have shaped who we are as a nation. So I thank you, Supervisor Arenas, and board members for this recognition and for your invaluable work on behalf of our community. Thank you so much. I would like to ask my colleagues to come down. We um, would be so honored to have you take a, for us to take a picture with you. So we are going to hold those commendations and I can help hold one of those. I have to say I'm fangirling a little bit. This is my, my first opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Jimenez, but I, I used to teach the, the circuit when I taught sixth graders, and another teacher I just shared at Ohlone Middle School created a game based on the circuit that, that I also used. So it's really, it's just exciting and really wonderful to meet you, Dr. Jimenez. Uh, our next... Um, item on today's agenda is public comment. This is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address uh, the board on any topic, not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. We are going to hear first from any speakers in chambers who have submitted a yellow card. The yellow cards are available at that back table. If you're desiring to speak at public comment, now is the moment to fill out your yellow card. When the first speaker begins speaking, we close the queue. Uh, for speakers on Zoom, now is also the time to raise your virtual hand. Again, we will close the queue when the first speaker begins speaking. Jess, who do we have with us today? We are at seven in chambers, 15 on Zoom, 16 on Zoom, so 20 plus and climbing. Okay, let's give that a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the whole queue, both in chambers and in Zoom when the first speaker begins speaking. So folks on Zoom, uh, now is the, the time. We'll give that a few extra seconds to see if the number stabilizes. How are we doing, Jess? Is it still 20, rising? 26 with some movement. Okay. Let's see. All right, you let me know when you think. Oh, Steady in chambers spot. and we're holding at 18 on Zoom. Holding? Down to 17. <laughs> Holding at 17? Holding at 17. All right, so we will hear the speakers first in chambers who have submitted cards, and then we will hear 17 speakers on um, 
on Zoom, and we're offering each speaker one minute today. Thank you so much. Our first speaker's in chambers. Um, I'll call a few names, and if you could please form a line in the center. We'll hear from Nancy, followed by Jackie, followed by Jesus, followed by Mark. Good morning. My name is Nancy Zhou from San Jose. Our community has been stressed out and traumatized by the relentless bombings and starvation in Gaza. Yesterday, the UN Security Council passed an immediate Ga Gaza ceasefire resolution. It's long overdue for the Board of Supervisors to pass a permanent ceasefire resolution recommended by the Human Rights Commission back in January. Let's remember Aaron Bushnell, a young active duty airman. Last month, he set himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. to send a desperate plea. Do not be complicit in genocide. Act now. Thank you. Jackie, are you here? Yes. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Dear Board of Supervisors, my name is Jackie Lopez, and I'm a community worker in a designated Spanish-speaking code at the East Valley Behavioral Health Clinic. The clinic is located at the corner of Jackson and McKee Road. I have been serving clients at this clinic since 2007. The clinic has been a cornerstone of the community, providing county specialty mental health services to the east side of San Jose since 1972. The clinic was opened under the advocacy of Dominique Cortese, who sought to bring services to this underserved community. I have worked with the department under the leadership of three separate directors, Nancy Pena, Tony Tullies, and now Sherry Taro. Unfortunately, the department has attempted numerous times to remove specialty behavioral health services from the Valley Health Center clinics. Over the course of my time at the clinic, I have been passionate about delivering culturally competent and compassionate in-person support to our monolingual Spanish-speaking community. The retention of, these, of the services I provide is paramount to providing the gold standard care. Thank you. It sounds like you didn't finish your statement. If you'd like to leave it with the clerk, we can put the whole statement into the public record. The next speaker, come on down. Thank you, supervisors and county executives. My name is Fobui. I'm a chief um, steward for SEIU 521 and psychiatric social workers. Um, I'm here today to urge the board um, to work with the Department, Behavioral Health Department, to look else well instead of displacing the clients, the constituents of Santa Clara County, and the staff. So, as we all know, that the department wanted to go through a reorg with the services at East Valley. It is difficult to navigate the services in this county already, as uh, Supervisor Smithians is aware, right? So to relocate the staff and the clients, that's not client care. That is a displacement. As we all know, transportation is already difficult enough as it is for them. But to make this change without being uh, aware, I think that's very irresponsible. So, thank you. Thank you. Next is, speaker, is Jesus Morales in chambers? Followed by Mark Trout, followed by Wendy Greenfield, followed by Surrender Dolly Wall. Again, please queue in the center. Go right ahead. Okay. Oh, my name is Jesus Morales. Estoy aquí, este. Este, sobre el, los programas que quieren quitar, los, los programas sobre las personas, sobre los intérpretes en los, este, en los hospitales, en, los, este, en la gente que te ayuda a cómo llegar a los, con los doctores, según lo quieren quitar. Y estoy, este, pues, este, 
diciendo de que es, por medio de esas personas nosotros tenemos doctores y si, si lo quitan, este, esas personas dejan de, de con, tener consulta con los doctores porque este, si por medio de ellos nosotros no podemos este, tener una consulta con el doctor. Entonces, sobre eso hay muchas personas que están en ese caso. Yo llevo seis meses queriendo tratar a un doctor y no puedo porque no hay un, alguien que te ayude. Es todo lo que quiero decirle. Necesito. Gracias a usted. We have a translation, please. Rosario. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. My name is Jesus Morales. And I, I come here because I'm against, um, of the, I'm against the fact that you want to take out the program of interpreters at the hospitals. Um, these people are helping a lot. Um, and they are good drivers. Without them, um, people are not able to get to doctors. And um, we, uh, uh, and without them, people are not able to get to the doctor's office and have, a, uh, have an appointment with doctors. And, um, and people would not go to the doctor. So that's why I come here to say that um, many people are in the same situation as I am. I've been having six months now to try to reach an, a doctor and try to reach for help, but I'm not able to. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Mark Trout. Oops to be followed by Wendy Greenfield. Okay, this comes from uh, Lord's Day 43 in our songbook. What is God's will for us in the ninth commandment? Answer, God's will is that I never give false testimony against anyone, twist no one's words, not gossip or slander, nor join in condemning anyone without a hearing or without a just cause. Rather, in court and everywhere else, I should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. These are devices the devil himself uses, and they would call down on me God's intense anger. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. And I should do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's good name. Now, I asked the individual that did the invocation uh, if they had a penis or a vagina, and they were not open to a conversation. but. I don't really know what a transgender is. I mean, I could say I was a lesbian trapped in a man's body since first grade at Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Our Lady of Mount Carmel in uh, Redwood City. Next speaker, please. Um, My name is Wendy Greenfield. I'm a Jewish woman who is grief-stricken by the horrors the people of Gaza are undergoing, with over 32,000 people, including 12,000 children killed, and close to 75,000 wounded in a land where most of its medical facilities have been destroyed. The UN Security Council resolution in favor of a ceasefire, if implemented, will only last two more weeks. The U.S. did not veto the ceasefire resolution this time, undoubtedly because more than 100 American cities and other local governments expressed the will of their citizens and called for a ceasefire and humanitarian aid in Gaza. Please agendize such a resolution for Santa Clara County, a self-declared human rights county, and stand against genocide abroad and the rise in bias in our own Muslim, Jewish, and Palestinian communities. To life. Si se puede. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have more speak? Go ahead. Can I speak? Oh. Hi, everyone. My name is Surinder Kar Dhaliwal. It has been 690 days since I last saw my son, Bultej. I miss him a lot. It's been 171 days since Hamas went in and uh, took hostages. My family helped build the San Jose Sea Gurdwara that serves 60 to 70K meals, hot meals per week. I'm not allowed to go there right now because Bob Dylan, Sukhdev Baniwal, and many of these other men are very corrupt and have hijacked our Gurdwara. I've learned a lot as a generational student of Sikh philosophy. I experience oneness regularly. I see through the fake smiles and bad acting by politicians that continue to protect judges like Zekar, who gave my ex-husband, Kumal Sangha, custody of my son. Free Palestine, ceasefire now. Our final speaker in chambers is Kari Crawford.
Go ahead. I'm here to ask you to agendize a resolution calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza as recommended by the Santa Clara County Human Rights Commission. It is widely understood that the genocide of Native Americans here is America's original sin, one that most Americans would agree that if we could do it all over again, we would do it differently. And so to learn that the federal government is funding yet another European colony which seeks to repeat this shameful history is a betrayal to all Americans, particularly Americans of color, who believed that things were getting better. And so we need to know where you guys stand because this genocide is literally killing us all. Firstly, because if they're willing to support the killing of innocent people of color abroad, that means they're still willing to do it here if they can get away with it. But secondly, and more concretely, the environmental impact of, C of the siege on Gaza has exceeded the annual carbon emissions of 20 countries combined within these last six months. It reached 281 annual. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. That concludes speakers in, in chambers. We'll move to speakers on Zoom. Our first speaker is Camila. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you can begin speaking. And you'll have to accept the unmute to open your microphone. Please go ahead. We understand that you are under a lot of pressure to dodge something as monumental as the live genocide that's happening in front of our eyes for six months now. We are asking you to add the ceasefire to the agenda to give you an opportunity to act on the recommendation from your own human rights commissions that called for a ceasefire back in January. Instead, some of you, and you know who you are, are going around pressuring the commission to withdraw the ceasefire resolution. Have you lost your mind? Have you lost all common sense? Is everything just a political game for you, even genocide? How can we trust you as leaders when you don't have any connection with reality? and you are incapable of taking a moral stand on a carnage that is committed by our gov government against the law and with our money against our will. What legacy are you leaving for yourself? If you continue this way, you are a disgrace for a place like Silicon Valley. Thank you. Our next speaker is Miral. We'll open your microphone. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Um, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm, a, I'm a US citizen. I live in Santa Clara. I urge you to um, agendize a ceasefire resolution in Gaza, permanent ceasefire. And I feel really horrible. Why do we need to come to ask you for that? Why don't you just do your job? Don't you have any morality in you? Don't you have any common sense? Over 35,000 people were killed already by US dollars by U.S. taxpayers' dollars. Half of them are children, half and, and counting. Children are dying now in Gaza because of starvation. And U.S. has to drop food and food aid by air to people to eat while they can still drive, use, use regular ways to uh, get their weapons, the U.S. weapons to kill citizens through all ways. Please do the, do be on the right side of. Our next speaker is resident. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Yes, well, good morning. I've been telling this, uh, the, the Board of Supervisors, County Council, uh, the, the County Executive's Office, that my son has already confirmed that my ex-wife was letting a uh, man anally rape him and that my other children have shown signs of the same kind of sexual abuse. Uh, the reason uh, this is so important is because social services refuses to, um, to conduct a, an evaluation. And that's because there's a conflict of interest with a private attorney who's making money off of this. Um, the, I mean, you guys aren't helping me. Please help me. I mean, if, if you don't help me, how is it that you guys can scrutinize and give advice to social services to make changes in the wake of uh, baby Phoenix's death. It just doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alan Kamara. We'll open your microphone. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisor. This is Alan Kamara. Um, today I call here uh, 
to please plead again to you all on behalf of all our nurses, our MPA, that you do everything in your power and for the sake of the community to avert the strike that was announced on Friday. I know diplomacy might look to some as, oh, it's a weak thing, but well, history has told us that it's diplomacy is always a strength, it's not a weakness. Um, James Williams, you can call Susie York today and you guys will go back to the table and resolve this. We do not want to strike. Our nurses do not want to strike and we don't want just the community to know that. I saw the press conference yesterday and our response is no, we do not want to strike. We want to get back to work. We want to just get a fair contract. That's all we have. Our next speaker is Nicholas. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. It's been two months since the Human Relations Committee charged with upholding human rights in Santa Clara County demanded that this Board of Supervisors pass a ceasefire resolution. Two months and around 15,000 deaths later, Ellenberg finally decided to respond, not with resolve or empathy, but with malicious complacency. 160 children dying every day in Gaza, even more than Auschwitz, and yet you stated that calling for a ceasefire in the midst of a genocide will do nothing for the people of this community. That said, I'd like to hold an adjournment for an amazing member of this community, Samira Bahus, who came to the U.S. after she was cleansed from her home in Palestine in 1948. She passed away two weeks ago with the same fascism she experienced then occurring now with a full endorsement of this council. Regarding South African apartheid, Desmond Tutu once said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. It is not for Ellenberg to decide for our community what would benefit us, but her obligation to act or get out of the way. We don't care about your political aspirations or pre-held racism. Palestinians, Arabs, must. Our next speaker is Noshaba. We'll open your microphone. Please go ahead. Hello, I'm just going to ask the County Board of Supervisors who are having side conversations to please stop and hear your constituents as we plea for you to pass, agendize an immediate ceasefire resolution. As an educator who has worked with school districts throughout Santa Clara County for the past 30 years, I have seen the impact our students are having when they watch our county supervisors, their teachers, their administrators, and the families doing nothing while this genocide unfolds. Uh, to put this in perspective, think of a city like Morgan Hill, all 13 elementary schools being bombed and every child, over 8,000 of them being killed, and still you'd have to kill an additional 5,000 children to equal the number of children killed in Gaza in the last six months of silence. Please, I am pleading for you to please immediately agendize and pass a ceasefire resolution and show the value of human life and be on the side of humanity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eilet. Please go ahead. Good morning and thank you. My name is Ayelet. I've lived and worked in Santa Clara County for much of my life. I'm a Jewish mother and educator, the granddaughter of Eastern European Zionist Jews who came to settle the land of Palestine in the 1930s, and I am here to ask for you to issue a resolution for an immediate, permanent ceasefire. In January, the Santa Clara County Human Rights Commission voted to send this board a letter calling for justice, and two months later, after at least 9,000 more people have been killed in the Israeli assault on Gaza, nothing is on the agenda. Please do this work that we are asking you to do. We must speak up. This must not continue in our name with our tax dollars. Never again means for every human. This is my belief as a Jewish person and as a human who sees my liberation as bound together with the liberation of all others in this world, including and especially Palestinians. Where are our representatives? Our next speaker is Musa. We'll open your microphone. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Musa with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. We wanted to urge the Santa Clara Board of Supervisors to agendize and pass a ceasefire resolution. 32,000 innocent men, women, and children in Gaza have been killed by Israel, including over 25,000 women and children, which is nearly 80% of the death toll. According to the UN, more children were killed in four months of war on Gaza than in four years of war around the world. The UN has reported that this is the fastest decline in a population's nutrition status ever recorded. 
According to recent polling by Data for Progress, 67% of all voters, majorities including 77% of Democrats, 69% of independents, and 56% of Republicans support the U.S. calling for a permanent ceasefire and a de-escalation of violence in Gaza. In January, the Santa Clara Board of Education passed a ceasefire resolution, and the Santa Clara Human Rights Commission issued a ceasefire statement. Governor Gavin Newsom recently called for a ceasefire in an open letter to Californian Muslims and Arabs. We urge this board to follow suit. It's symbolic the least you can do to acknowledge the deep pain of your community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nadine. We'll open your microphone. Please go ahead. Thank you. In January, Santa Clara County's own Human Relations Commission sent a powerful letter recommendation to this board to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. They simply reaffirmed this recommendation a few weeks ago when there was an attempt by a single member of this board to have HRC withdraw their recommendation. I want to reiterate that the County Board of Supervisors plays a critical role in denouncing violence and ensuring safety for all residents in this county. And we are not safe in this county when our own board is silent when a single group, Palestinians, are being massacred. Human rights are, in uni are universal. Your support for them is either universal or it doesn't exist. If you only care about your own, that is not, then it is not about human rights, but privilege you care about. So either you believe in equality, liber liberty, security, and dignity for Palestinians, or for nobody at all. Silence on this matter when the majority of the community in the world is unified in demanding a ceasefire while our taxpayer money is being used to fund genocide is not acceptable. Ceasefire now, add a ceasefire resolution to the next agenda. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zach Kleiman. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Zach Kleiman. Um, I'm um, a local Jew. My mom um, is actually currently living um, in my grandma's house in uh, Palo Alto. Um, this is my grandmother who was born in 1930 in Berlin um, and uh, escaped uh, Nazis for her. Her exposure to Nazi ethnic nationalism made her a lifelong anti-Zionist. Um, yet mere blocks away from where she lives um, is Congresswoman Anna Eshoo's office who recently um, voted to ban uh, funding for the largest Palestinian refugee agency um, and has put her name on discharge petition number nine, calling for more funds to the Israeli government. Uh, Santa Clara County's uh, vote for a ceasefire would be far from, uh, be, it's important symbolically, but be far from symbolic as it's one of the largest counties in the country and the home of many key representatives um, in Congress. Please ceasefire now. Uh, from local. Our next speaker is Victoria. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Victoria Angelo. I have been a nurse for 17 years and served my community proudly, taking care of patients at their time of great need. I come before you at this time asking you to please support our union, our NPA, as we uh, negotiate with the county, asking them to come back to the table with um, meeting, you know, so getting at least closely to what we're asking for. We're not asking for much. We are asking, you know, for safety, for things that help us take care of our patients in a way that they deserve. A lot of these patients we care for, we see them on a regular basis. So not only do we know them, we know their families. We know how to care for them in a way that traveler nurses don't. Other nurses that aren't familiar with them would not. We proudly serve our community, and we ask that the county proudly take care of their nurses and keep us safe. Thank you. Our next speaker is Omar. Please go ahead. Hello. Earlier this meeting, we spent time honoring the memory of respect to community members who have lost their lives. May they all rest in peace. I'd like to add an adjournment, which was missing from today's agenda. Recently, countless families of Santa Clara County have lost hundreds of family members over the last six months in Gaza, over 80 of which are my own. They were doctors, business owners, professors, and students, from young people with aspiring hopes and dreams to old who have spent their lives struggling to establish themselves due to occupation, oppression, and finally genocide. They all leave behind a legacy of being loving, generous, vibrant, and beautiful souls who desired nothing except the right to live. The right to live, which was stolen from them unjustly by the Israeli military as they continue to target civilians in intentionally block humanitarian aid, causing famine, disease, and a complete collapse of their healthcare system. 
and their loving memory, and myself and other community members are urging you to support ceasefire resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alisar. Please go ahead. Your community is hurting. On October 7th, we watched the Israelis grieving for the lives they lost on that day. In the five months that followed, we have been watching the Palestinians grieving for the lives they lost. Their day of death and destruction repeated every day for 172 days and counting. An expert on Holocaust studies called Israel's actions a textbook case of genocide. He called this on October 13th last year, only one week after Israel began its assault. We are watching thousands of families torn apart, literally televised, and we know that our federal government chose a side, that it's using our tax dollars to send Israel more and more weapons. This must stop. Please pass a resolution urging a permanent ceasefire. Our next speaker is Dora. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Dora Rosen. I'm a member of the Reform Temple Beth El. My family has been in Santa Clara County for four generations. Apologies for not being there in person. I sprained my ankle. And also, I am calling in favor of the county passing a ceasefire resolution and offer a, a clause saying that the county would like to see the UNRWA funding restored also. I said my family's been here for four generations. A lot of us were originally from Germany and Austria. Unfortunately, I came over before the Nazis rose to power. But many of my family were killed. Sometimes, and we know the U.S. was complicit in not letting people come into the U.S. Now I see the U.S. is complicit in another genocide, and I'm horrified that it's being done at the behest of Israel, a state which claims to speak in the name of myself. So I'm pleased asking the council to underline that we all say never again for anybody. This must stop. Our next speaker is Zara. Please go ahead. Zara, you'll need to. You'll need to. Hello, my name is Zahra. Uh, what's happening in Gaza now and what's been happening it's not a show, it's not a horror show. It's something that can happen to any of you, to your family. Imagine that's happening to your kids or family, any member of your family, it is not acceptable. You have the power and you have the choice to be in the right side of history. You have that. We can make, the, we can make a difference, you can make a, a choice. Please cease fire now, please, no more killing, no more killing, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fatima. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Fatima Suleiman, and I demand you to agendize a ceasefire resolution. I go to Santa Clara High School, in which my peers and I are shocked by the genocide in Gaza. 4.5% of Gazan children in shelters are suffering from severe wasting. At least 23 children have died already from severe malnutrition. We students are traumatized by the news coming from Gaza. Women being raped, kids in surgery without anesthesia, demolished hospitals. The rate of deaths in Palestine exceeds that of any other armed conflict in the 21st century. We students in Santa Clara County simply cannot live and stay normally knowing that food, humanitarian aid, and education are being denied to innocent children in Gaza. Please, a ceasefire resolution is a necessary and perfectly fair way to acknowledge the pain and trauma in our community and to stand up for our values, peace, and humanity. Thank you. Our final speaker is Alpha. Please go ahead. Alpha. Hi, uh, sorry, I just tell us that news. Um, uh, please uh, just call in for permanent ceasefire. This is important. And so we can continue trusting our uh, government body and our authorities. Please, permanent ceasefire. I'm a resident of Santa Clara County. And uh, really, uh, we have a farm and really we actually voting for peace and this community and outside community. And so we can heal all together. Permanent ceasefire. I do appreciate your work. Thank you. And that concludes public comment.
Thank you very much, and thank you for all of the members of the public who came today to share your thoughts and requests with us. Uh, item seven is approval of the consent calendar, so I'm going to look first to our clerk to review the consent calendar as it currently stands. Um, I'll open with an announcement that items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. We have a request from Vice President Lee to add item number 14 to the consent calendar. Item number 14 is to receive report relating to digital equity strategy. We have a request from Supervisor Aranis to consider item number 16 at no earlier than one o'clock p.m. Item number 16 is to receive report relating to options for structural changes regarding oversight of the Department of Family and Children's Services. We have a request from administration to hold item numbers 18 and 19 to April 16th, 2024. Item number 18 is to receive report relating to the countywide community violence prevention strategic plan for fiscal year 2425 and options for establishing a community violence prevention fund. Item number 19 is to receive report relating to options to improve access to mental health care services for adults in the county. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 22B from the consent calendar. Item number 22B is to approve minutes of the March 12, 2024 regular meeting. There's a correction to item number 41. The item should read as follows. Approve delegation of authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, extend, or terminate stipend agreements with up to 10 individuals relating to participating in the New Americans Fellowship Summer 2024 cohort in an amount not to exceed $10,000 per agreement and contract terms that begin no earlier than June 3rd, 2024 and end no later than August 30th, 2024 following approval by County Council as to form and legality and approval by the Office of the County Executive. Delegation of authority shall expire on August 30th, 2024, sub subject to the Levine Act. Levine Act. <laughs> Correction to item number 50. The item should reflect that it is subject to the Levine Act, LA-1. Item number 50 is to approve amended delegation of authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate agreement with Home First Services of Santa Clara County relating to providing temporary housing services, increasing the maximum delegated amount by $1 million from $2,194,188 to $3,194,188 and extending the delegated contract term limit through June 30th, 2024. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to delete item number 61N. Item number 61N is to adopt a commendation for Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. There's a correction to item number 61O. The item should read as follows. Adopt commendation for Dr. Pamela Lindsay with a spelling correction for receiving the Santa Clara County Women's Leadership and Policy Summit Lifetime Achievement Award for her leadership and achievements in advancing educational opportunity for students with learning needs. That concludes my updates. Thank you very much. I will look down the row uh, to my colleagues. Please turn your light on if you have any additional changes to the consent calendar. I see Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask colleagues at item 14, and this is the digital equity strategy that was put on consent by Supervisor Lee, be deferred till the April 16th board meeting. Um, and there are a couple of requests that I'd like to make as it comes back to us. One is that on page two, there's a, a notation that the current federal benchmark speeds for broadband are 25 megabits per sec per second download in three, um, um, I think this is megabits, up, uploaded. The FCC raised the federal benchmark to 100 um, MBS download and 20 MBS upload on March 14th. Uh, so I'd like that to be reflected in the final document. 
Uh, the FCC also made some um, changes to long-term broadband speed that should be included as well and be accurate in the in at least the, the legislative file. Um, second, I would like to give the staff an opportunity to review, review the referrals that were co-authored by President Ellenberg and myself that were passed by the board unanimously December 14th um, of 2021 and April 19th of 2022 um, so that the staff's, at least the staff report is reflective of the board direction. And I recognize that will be difficult to do in the body of the report, but the staff report should be able to, to address that. And then colleagues, I, I will just say that um, based on the, the, um, the gap between the report and the direction that I'll be working with Supervisor Ellenberg to give my colleagues something in writing that also addresses uh, where these gaps are. Um, I requested to- um, Excuse me, I just want to confirm. April, did you say April 16th? Yes, okay, thank yes, you. thank you. Um, I requested to remove item 22B on our March 12th regular board meeting minutes um, to get it off, but I'll, I'm happy to put it back on consent. Colleagues, you may recall that we had a very um, robust discussion about equity and I claimed my intent to vote no on, um, on item, on one item, and I'm, I apologize, this was, um, let me just look and see what item it was. Oh, it was item 22B on our March 12th uh, board meeting, and I was vociferous about my desire to vote no, and then I voted yes. So what I'd like the minute, I know, and, and the only way to remedy it, colleagues, would be to bring the vote back, rescind it, and that moves us too close to the budget process, so I'm not doing that, but I would like the minutes to reflect my intent uh, to vote no, and, and, and part of the reason, colleagues, that I'm raising it is that it was very important to me, particularly related to the issues we were discussing with equity, which is why I'm not gonna put us through the torture of a rescinding the vote, but I would like the minutes to reflect mm -hmm. um, my concerns if my colleagues don't have any concerns about that. Supervisor Chavez, I, I believe you meant to reference item 16 from the prior meeting. You referenced 22B, which I think is today's minutes. Oh, thank item. you, that's right. And I apologize, I did not have that in my notes, but it is item 16 thank you. from uh, our previous board meeting, thank you. Um, and then on um, item 50, uh, I know this is a, a really important item and I know um, I have colleagues up here who've been working really uh, diligently to address um, issues and I'm just gonna say a specific thank you to Supervisor Lee. I do wanna ask um, staff is, as these issues continue to come back to the board, if they could outline under what circumstances it may make sense for the county to be an operator. I think that's a question we need to, to answer um, as we move forward. And those are all my, my comments. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, we have been advised that certain items on the consent calendar today may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language in our published agenda. Levine. Specifically, we've been advised that items 23, 24, 25, 26, 29, 31, 32, 33, 37, 40, 41, 47, 48, 50, 51, 52, 55, 64, and 66 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We have also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings as defined by the Levine Act has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or the clerk of the board or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason that I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you. I should also indicate at this time that uh, when we get to the report from county council, uh, I'll ask about some recent efforts that are being made to uh, try and uh, identify uh, folks uh, who are um, 
I gather, parties to the Levine Act, uh, or parties to our agenda items, and therefore subject to the Levine Act. I'll, I'll do that under the report from the uh, council, if I may. And then on item 23, uh, which deals with refugee services contracts, uh, I'm happy to leave that one on consent. Uh, in fact, glad to see uh, progress there. I, I want to confirm, if I may, that we are expecting, I see Key Lee in the uh, room, thank you, that we are expecting uh, additional uh, measures to come to our full board on April the 16th at our next board meeting. Am I remembering the date correctly? Thank you, through the chair. And also just want to ask staff um, to sort of continue to explore uh, this process uh, as fully as possible, um, including between now and the 16th, so that if there's progress that can be made. I do have concerns about the adequacy of federal funding for the uh, needs of refugees and would like to see us do whatever we can to uh, make sure that these folks get the help they need at a very trying time in the world and in their lives. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. A um, couple of items. For first is item number 43 uh, on the consent uh, regarding the Environmental Agency's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Um, I'm leaving that on the command, uh, the, on consent with the following comments. I want to first recognize and thank the Office of Sustainability staff for all the great work on the Climate Protection Reduction Grant process. This is an incredible opportunity to obtain a large amount of funds to support our county's climate work and staff have done a great job identifying opportunities for collaboration that will ensure competitive applications. The Priority Climate Action Plan, in collaboration with San Benito County, which was submitted in March, is very strong. I look forward to seeing the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, CCAP, to be developed in 2025. And I'm glad that the community engagement activities are being planned to include the community in the development of the CCAP. Please update our offices when the focus groups, workshops, Etc. are being announced so that we can help spread the word to our residents for better outreach. And thank you so much for that. Uh, for item number 50, uh, I would also like to leave it on consent regarding the um, uh, termination agreement and extension to Home First Services uh, for the next 90 days. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to dispel any rumors that the Sunnyvale Hamlin Court is closing or going to lay off people. It is not closing, but there will be a change of operator in this nine, after the 90 days. As we transition the operation of Hamlin Court Shelter from Home First to a new operator, I would like to request administration to solicit input from our stakeholders like Sunnyvale Community Services, the City of Sunnyvale, Helping Hand, and other important stakeholders to share lessons learned and forward these feedback to the new operator. It is absolutely important that the new shelter operator be in dialogue with these stakeholders to make this transition as smooth as possible. First, during the short extended period, I also want to provide a certain condition that no current employees or clients are being forced up without just cause. Second, I would also like to ask that the administration and the county council provide options, provisions, and any contract with a new operator for Sunnyvale Shelter after this extension with Home First expires that provide for retention of existing non-exempt employees at the shelter, provided that they are in good standing, meaning the minimum qualification of the op new operator, and have been employed at the shelter for a specified minimum period of time. In crafting these options, the administration should take into consideration the effect that any such provision would have on this ability to attract the most qualified shelter operator to make this a success. I've heard anecdotally that many shelter staff are fearful after the announcement that they will lose their jobs before the new operator takes over the shelter. And I want to ensure a seamless transition between the operators and retaining staff who know the clients will be critical. And that's all I have for the consent calendar. Thank you, President. Calendar. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, this is for item number 14, and I know this is going to get deferred uh, to April 16th, but then in the meantime, I did want to bring up the dispor disproportionate um, impact of digital access to South County, and so I'm hoping that I, we can discuss some of those digital barriers um, and 
potentially replicate a, a community Wi-Fi program in South County, similar to what the city of San Jose um, has done in order to just really uh, connect folks to, um, to the internet. Um, so in the meantime, I'd love to see what we could explore. I'm bringing this in particular, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we could take a look at what um, is being done regionally and um, potentially prevent any duplication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have public speakers on the consent calendar? We do. We have a total of five at present. Great. We will close the queue at five if there's no one else looking, uh, hurrying to get a yellow card and no one else raising their hand on Zoom. Let's give that a second. We'll close the queue at five when the first speaker begins speaking. And uh, we'll off for two minutes per speaker. Holding it five. Our speakers and chambers are Rose, to be followed by Liz Stewart, to be followed by Surrender Dollywall, to be followed by Rico Mendez. Rose, if you'll approach. And speak into the podium here. Morning. You could center yourself right at the podium. That's I'm perfect. So sure. Thank you. A handicapped woman was banned from the Sunnyvale shelter for a year because her small dog bit another client. My name is Rose. I just retired. I'm a registered nurse working at a veterans hospital. I have been helping this handicapped woman for a while and she could hardly walk. She was staying in a tent across the street from the shelter. I asked the staff if they can at least charge her wheelchair so she can use it, but they said no because of home first rules. Here are all her health issues that she texted to me. Partially legally blind in my peripheral vision from brain surgery in 2000. Severe osteoarthritis and left hip groin area. My hip right now is also in pain from recent bus accident. I also have a major left soldier, shoulders pain due to the bus accident. I have to have two knee replacements and hip replacement. I am grossly, grossly obese. I also suffer from depression. This is a very, very disturbing that they left this client outside and able to go anywhere because of the rules. She's not allowed to go near to the shelter at all. She cannot even use the bathroom. And I'm hoping this incident is not going to happen again to anyone who is handicapped. This kind of rules is inhumane. I want to be very clear that this is not about the staff. The staff are great and they are just following the home first rules. The staff need to be retained once the change management happens. I've known them for most years and they are wonderful towards the client. The staff are just following the, the rules. We placed her in a motel for four nights and that at this time she is on her way back to her very small tent. I am hoping that we can help her go back to the shelter soon. She can stay in a tent and leave words like a dog. Can you please help her? We cannot treat people like this, especially people who cannot defend himself or herself. That's why I am here to talk about them. This is very inhumane. And she needs to go back to the shelter's shelter as soon as she can. This is not right. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna ask the speaker to, uh, direct speaker to talk to our staff. Michelle will, will, will talk to you about regarding the shelter issues. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liz Stewart, and I'm a homeless advocate. For 18 years, I have been a very strong supporter of Home First. I have supported them and talked to my friends about them, and I've given them donations, and I've been one of their biggest cheerleaders, but this has all really gone downhill, and things have taken a dive, and I just can't support them anymore. Last summer, things were so bad at the shelter that they removed all the children and all the families from the shelter. The shelter fired a bunch of black people. They kicked out a black woman and banned her from every shelter in the county that they owned. I know because I was bringing her food. They fired Kelsey Fleming, who I had worked with, and she had been there for 20 years, and she was really their shining light. Um, at the same time, they put on a very nice song and dance for all of you. They've had PowerPoints and slides, and they've talked about their certifications, and they hired an investigator who vindicated them. Well, surprise, surprise. If you hire an investigator, they will vindicate you because they know that you are writing their check. Um, they called advocates' information to be misinformation and tried to get us to go away. 
please never trust anyone who tries to get the advocates to go away. Um, they paid their, a bunch of employees to come and say how wonderful it was to work at home first with their words curated by Lori Smith. Um, and then in the meantime, now they've been hit with a wage theft lawsuit. In, a, in the past, they lost that lawsuit and it cost $17,000. And of course, you basically paid that since you fund them. Um, after 18 years, I have had to pull the plug on my donations. You should do the same. Please do not fund them any further. Um, however, please do make the county an operator or find another vendor. I feel that the problems at Home First are at the top. I really like your suggestion of keeping the non-exempt employees um, in place until a new operator can come in and set this place straight. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Hi everyone, Surrender Cardaliwal again. Um, I'm speaking on item number 31 regarding Behavioral Health Services Department. Uh, you all are going to vote on increasing by 7.5 million, totaling an increase of 24.1 million for one year for locum, locum psychiatric staffing services. In June 15, 2023, Santa Clara Board of Supervisors approved 11.3 billion budget for coming fiscal year that enhances behavioral health. The U.S. behavioral health market is expected to expand from 83.7 billion in 2023 to 1.5. I'm sorry, excuse me, 115.21 billion by 2030. Each dollar poured into behavioral health impacts someone's life. These funds you're approving are feeding psychiatrists, therapists, and big pharma. The USA sells more antipsychotics than any other nation. Psychiatrists and therapists, therefore, are often biased. Just do the math. What chance do our children have if they will one day be feeding their own earnings into this corrupt industry? The children born today are even more likely to fall victim of file, false diagnoses, over-medication, and forced therapy. Using myself in his, as an example, in 2014, a new employee working at Facebook and getting a lot of attention from Mark Zuckerberg, I seeked therapy for the first time in my life because I was kidnapped as a child, and as a mother, my worrying for my children turned into anxiety. That started my mental health nightmare. Seek philosophy helps people overcome lots of mental health issues for free. Let me say that again. Seek philosophy helps people live happier, joyful, and peacefully for free. Visiting Gurdwaras regularly and participating in selfless service helps one lead a life worth living and have habits and own up to their own behaviors. Again, it's free. Oh, last thing. Thank Magically, you. That's, that's ex exceeding your time, ma'am. Thank you so Rico? much. Can we turn off the mic, please, when a speaker's time is, uh, has ended? Thank you so much. Our next speaker. Do we have Rico Mendez in chambers? Good morning, Board of Supervisors and staff. My name is Rico Mendez, Chief Elected Officer of SEIU Local 521. Uh, there's so much on the agenda that is really important services related to programs that service the vulnerable in our community. And uh, as we know, labor unrest can impact these services in a serious way. So um, we really encourage you to try to find some resolution with our labor siblings, our NPA, the nurses, SCIU 521 members, as you know, work side by side with these nurses each day, providing really critical care to the people of Santa Clara County children, families, vulnerable, people that might be in a car accident and have to go to a trauma center, right? It's all coming here to our workers in the county and uh, to what you oversee as a board. So I just encourage you to do your best to try to reach a resolution. For us here in California, you know all workers have the right to honor a picket line here. They can vote their conscience. And uh, SCIU 521 represents many thousands of people that badge into work every day at some healthcare related facility where our MPA may have a picket line. So we will be, of course, letting our members know that they have the right to honor that picket line and you as a county would then have to deal with reassigning them and everything that comes along with that. So it would be great if we can find a resolution, uh, find a pathway forward. And uh, you know, if we can help in any way, please let us know. Thank you. 
Our speaker online is resident. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, I'd like to speak about item 16. Um, I know that we're, we're addressing... Uh, Excuse me, item 16 is on the regular calendar, and you're, you're welcome to speak on that item. Um, sure. It's a time certain I, I, for 1 o'clock. Sure. So, I mean, I know that we're going to be talking about uh, missing red flags and allowing alleged abusers to be present when a child is being interviewed. But one thing I'd like for us to discuss on, on, on that topic is mitigating conflicts of interest, because this isn't just happening to me, this is happening to other parents. It happened to Violet Brooks and her three kids who were unfortunately sexually abused until they turned 18 because of this same particular attorney who was involved in their case as well. And um, really this county has gone haywire, completely haywire, because uh, as a result of me speaking out and me trying to protect my kids, I'm being assaulted. I've been assaulted so many times by poison that my testicles have atrophied, all my organs have been damaged, and the shape of my face has changed. If you Google Valerie Houghton poison, you'll see how she completely destroyed the, the, my facial structure. Um, and the county is just completely ignoring it because there are conflicts of interest. She's, she's connected, well connected, to a judge and um, they're influencing how social services uh, reacts to my allegations. I mean, they're, I mean, it's a no brainer that once a child um, uh, reports that they've been anally raped, that you conduct an evaluation, you just do it. Um, there's nothing, nothing, there's nothing lost. You, you either confirm it or, 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 or you deny it. And, um, and, and um, this just isn't happening. I hope we can discuss this at this meeting. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Thank you. I may have a motion to approve the consent calendar as so amended. Thank you. Second. Motion by Lee, second by Chavez. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you very much. Item eight is a referral uh, on the policy on the use of county facilities for community events, Supervisors Chavez and Lee. Thank you very much. I know that, um, that uh, Supervisor Lee has been trying to um, kind of wrestle this to the ground and we've spent, um, I've been a, de uh, a supervisor now for almost, or a little over 10 years, and one of the things that I've really appreciated is um, being able to attend and see the countless community events that we've helped support, both in this building and at different places in the county. Uh, helping nonprofits and community groups put on events to celebrate and get their message out or bring vital resources to the people is really important, but more important, I would just say, is that it allows us to build relationships with folks so that they're more interested in partnering with us on, on bigger issues. And I think we really saw that uh, pay off quite a bit during COVID. Um, but as, as all of you know, these events or gatherings are, take a ton of work and our goal is to make them smooth and easy and, they, and navigating our, our processes are frankly our non-existent um, processes, like I think we've all just sort of put it together over the years, responding to community need is, um, as, is not working any longer. And so what I'm asking um, and what Supervisor Otto Lee and I are asking is to make sure there's a streamlined process for all the board offices and the administration and the staff and the event organizers so that we actually have a process that everybody knows what the rules are and that recognizing we're going into a tough budget time that we can really be thinking about you know, recognizing what uh, resources it requires. Um, so um, in addition, I wanna sunshine the specific request for an evaluation of the fiscal and staffing implications of both the board offices um, and also the staff so that, so that we can look at, um, you know, the most appropriate way to proceed. And so I will ask that, um, 
that we not only take a look at events that happen here, but also events that happen in the community. And I just want to give one just kind of more anecdotal um, perspective. The, the board, the board, if you're here on the weekends, and all of us have been, you know that at certain times we're using different parts of the building for the community. And the way I look at this building is it belongs to the community. And, and we, we want people to feel like this is their home. And so what's a little challenging about that is that it has an impact on the staff, it has an impact on the facility, and, and we don't really have a way of quantifying that. We don't say, you know, here's what each, here's how the community accesses the building. So what happens now for an event is people go to auto, frankly, because Dave inherited that from Primo, that Pete McHugh, like uh, Pete McHugh, uh, Supervisor McHugh, for those of you who don't remember him. And so what that, what that meant was there was a tradition of community folks coming right to this office. So this office defaulted to buying chairs and tents and somebody calling and then making it available. And, it, and it's not a fair expectation of one office. And then what happens is that if their office is busy, they come over to our office. And we both have bought equipment, including translation equipment, when the county didn't have it. So people came to our office in fact, you know what? We don't have it anymore. I think one of the departments is took it. Not in a bad way, they're using it. So, so all that is to say that um, I would really uh, like the staff to be as holistic and thoughtful as possible, but recognizing that our, our outcome is to give access and have partnerships, especially with the littler nonprofits that just do not have the resources to get chairs and tents and all the other things that we want to do in our community. So one is we want people to have a deep connection to the community. The second is one of the number one issues we deal with, whether it's depression or health of any kind, is that people don't feel like they belong. We just had a, we just heard from a bunch of people in the community giving us feedback about that. So all the events that people put on, as troubling as they can be to our staff from a logistics perspective, that's community building in real time, real life. So that's why um, we're bringing this forward. We would really like a thoughtful response to the staff. I would recommend doing surveys with the um, board offices so they can talk about what they think the needs are. Um, and, and I would like it to be, you know, honestly, it's just been painful and it, it shouldn't be painful for any of us up here to do what we're asked to do from the community. So I'd like the pain to go away and I'd like a process. and. And I think it should be thoughtful and robust, and it should have the outcome of people being connected to us and our services and then connected to each other. And that would be my motion. Second. Thank you. Do, we, or do you want yes. to add? Yes, please. First of all, <clears throat> thank you, Supervisor Chavez, for uh, this uh, important referral. Uh, this is really an opportunity for us to continue support and provide services through our CBOs, our community-based organization partners. Although our CBO partners have, may have the resources to put, say, a health fair or a town hall together, we know that the cost of renting a facility or equipment for an event can be a huge financial burden and ultimately limit the ability to do the outreach to bring these vital services to our community as a whole. Our county facilities should be bringing the community together, serving as a hub, and as she said, this is really the people's building. This is the people's gathering room. So on weekends, I see no reason why we should not be using that to get people together. The process itself should not be ad hoc. It really should be streamlined, and that has not been the case uh, as we have experienced for so long. So that's why last year I have brought forth this referral to start this discussion regarding equipment rentals for community-based organization events, and we know the administration is also working hard on developing this process. This referral continues to pick up where that referral left off to include facility rentals or usage as well, and I think this is exactly why uh, it is important to make sure that uh, the rules are clear uh, and that it's transparent to everybody, uh, and that uh, I just also want to specifically shout out uh, on our staff member, Tevu. He's a saint. <laughs> he really is. Everybody knows who he is, and how much he has literally been backward for our communities to make these events happen on countless weekends and countless of hours and backbreaking work. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for Tevu for doing all that without the system in place, and hopefully with the system in place, it will be uh, more clearer and, and makes it uh, fairer for everybody at the end of the day. Thank you. I will go to public comment, please. 
Hi, Anjane. You weren't there when I was <laughs> last looking to the right. No speakers in chambers or on Zoom. All right, we have a motion by Chavez, a second by Lee. Let's vote on this item. Supervisor Reynes? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor, yes. <laughs> Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item nine is our county executive's report. Good morning. I just wanted to take a couple minutes uh, in the county executive report today to share a little bit about um, the current status and what is uh, going on regarding negotiations with our uh, nurses union, RNPA. Uh, as the board is aware, uh, but to share with the public and broader organization, the county did receive a strike notice from RNPA for a three-day strike next week, April 3rd, 4th, uh, se sorry, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Um, we um, have been in negotiations with RNPA uh, since the early fall. Um, and continue to hope to reach a fair and sustainable agreement with our dedicated nurses. These are truly extraordinary, hardworking professionals who help deliver critical safety net services in our community. And um, we absolutely are supportive of a fair contract for our nurses as well as all of our other uh, public employees here at the county who deliver really excellent service and care, uh, especially to those most in need. Uh, we do have a public website with uh, details on uh, the um, any anticipated service impacts. Uh, the important thing for the public to know is our hospitals will remain open. Uh, we know they provide uh, critical emergency care and access to those critical services uh, will remain available and the county's taking all steps to make sure that that happens. Um, there may be impacts to primary care or, or, or other visits and Folks will hear about that and we will keep that website updated, but uh, the trauma care and emergency access uh, from our three hospitals uh, will remain available. Of course, we, we hope to reach uh, a fair sustainable agreement with our uh, nurses as soon as we possibly can uh, and we'll continue to keep the public updated uh, as things proceed. Could you share the website, please? Yeah, it's, um, I think probably the easiest thing to do is for people to access it from our um, from our main page, there's actually a banner right at the top that's updates uh, on the situation. So the best place for people to go is santaclaracounty.gov, and there's a banner right there at the top. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Um, yes, I, I wanted to make a request, and, and uh, I wanted, I'm trying to figure out how to take an action without making the meetings, you know, a week longer. And that is that um, whenever we have housing items, I, I do think there would be a value if we're gonna keep them on consent to having a, at least a single mechanism for reporting out the total impact relative to the work that we're doing um, in housing. And the reason for that is that um, I think it's really important that the board, that it's really easy for us to talk about that without pulling every single item off to say, here's how many more people are being housed or here's how much uh, resources are moving to one place or another. And, um, and, I, and I know I've asked for us to have an annual or maybe even a biannual report, um, but I, I just think it's really critical. Like there were so many items that would have been worth saying well done to the staff on. And, and even if you, if you wouldn't mind, it could be even a part of your report. But the reason I'd like something in writing is I'd like something that we're able to, to uh, cut and paste and put in our newsletters. And I would say that where we have big, uh, chunky volumes of work, that could be helpful. I think the work that when we're expanding, especially behavioral health services, is another opportunity. And of course, we want to be efficient and leave things on consent when the reports are clear and, and thank people. But if there's no way to really communicate this, because these are, I mean, I have four binders of material, so being able to convey that to the public in an easy way is, is, is impossible unless we have support from you all to do that. A absolutely, I, I do know that there are um, now periodic regular agenda, some reports, but we can work with uh, the department on having some kind of summary table or something accompany uh, those collection of items. That would be really helpful as, par as part of the board packet. Thank you so much. And then happy birthday again. Thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Lee. Thank you, uh, President Ellenberg. Um, I, I, I certainly heard the bad news uh, regarding the strike letter that, you, that the county has received from the RNPA. So uh, James, could you elaborate a little bit more as to what 
procedures or contracts you're working on to activate uh, in order to provide a coverage, and what's going to be the fiscal impact for the county? Sure. Um, so as I as I mentioned, you know, we given the nature of the services that we're talking about, especially the hospital services, uh, we uh, absolutely need to make sure that those continue to be operational. Um, so as a result, uh, the county has uh, staffing contracts for um, primarily nurses, but also ancillary staff uh, to ensure continuity of operations um, given um, um, folks that will be employees that will be honoring the picket lines. Um, the cumulative fiscal impact uh, from those contracts for next week's strike is anticipated to be um, more than $20 million. And if for some reason the strike does not take place, do we get to recoup those funds or is this something that's already expended? The overwhelming majority of those costs are already um, locked in because of the nature of how those contracts work. Um, and with each passing day, that increases. But the, the long story short is, um, at this point, those are sunk costs. Okay. Has there been any scheduled time to get back to continuing mediation on this issue? Uh, we have repeatedly expressed uh, willingness to meet at any time that, that uh, RMPA is available, um, both through the mediation process and otherwise. There is not a current um, scheduled session. Yeah, and we will continue to make ourselves available at any time to meet. I, I'm very concerned about the fiscal impact, obviously, number one, but two also is the, the fact that uh, there's no scheduled uh, meeting coming up. So I really would like to urge, uh, do whatever all means necessary so that we could get folks back to the negotiating table. Hopefully we can get this thing through, maybe with the help of a mediator. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, our next item is, uh, 10 is for the County Council's report. At the March 25th, 2024 meeting, uh, closed session meeting by unanimous vote, the board authorized the county to initiate litigation in one matter. The name of the action and the defendant, as well as the substance of the litigation shall be disclosed once litigation has been formally commenced to any person upon inquiry. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Seeing uh, no lights on for questions or comments, we'll move to item 11. Before we do that, Madam Chair, forgive me for of being course. slow on the light there. Through the chair, if I may, to County Council, I wonder if you could share with uh, both the board and the public the uh, approach you're taking on Levine Act items and uh, attempting to identify um, parties uh, to the Levine Act pursuant to state law. And um, just uh, some of the mechanics, I think, are helpful to understand. Yeah, so uh, Supervisor Smitty, in the most recent effort, uh, is to uh, include identification forms that we are providing, contract managers are providing to all contractors as part of the contract stack, the documents that go with contracts. Uh, and uh, those are given to the contractors and any listed subcontractors. Uh, and those contractors uh, have to identify uh, the party name, obviously, but also any agents uh, associated with, um, with them. Uh, those are then uh, provided uh, back to the contract managers. We have attorney, uh, I'm sorry, attorneys that monitor uh, 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 to ensure that those forms are collected. Uh, we then uh, provide those forms uh, to outside counsel. Uh, outside counsel checks uh, any uh, names of parties or agents against campaign contribution records that uh, board members have I identified. And to the extent that uh, there is any potentially disqualifying contribution, uh, county counsel is responsible at that point for notifying a board member prior to the meeting to ensure that they have uh, awareness. and. You know, we've allowed, this is now the third meeting that we've been collecting those uh, forms. You see uh, them attached uh, uh, to uh, uh, most of the contract-oriented agenda items. Uh, that there has been some scale-up time. I think we've got uh, much more robust usage of those identification forms at this point. There are and will continue to be some gaps uh, in the agenda. And I'll just say a little bit about what those gaps are. In some cases, um, there are not yet contracts in place 
but there are discussions uh, or board actions that implicate an upcoming uh, contract. For instance, we don't collect forms uh, for delegations of authority. Uh, and so you'll you know, notice a number of different items on the agenda today. I think there are five or six that are delegations of authority where we don't have forms included. Um, and then uh, there's also um, appointments and privileging actions uh, that implicate the Levine, I'm sorry, the Levine Act. Uh, and um, for those we don't collect forms, we simply provide the names of the individuals to our outside counsel to check uh, their names against uh, uh, against the campaign contribution records. And last, I would just say that there are some last minute di additions to the agenda. Uh, I think we had one of those today. We do our best when we can't get the, uh, uh, the forms in place to provide whatever information we can to outside counsel to, uh, to do a check. Through the chair, um, that additional information comes to us uh, and to the public by way of a supplemental then, is that correct? As the Term of art, I think our clerk's office uses a supplemental. Uh, yes, that, that would be correct. It would be a, um, papers would show up in a supplemental, correct? If, if there is a form that it, we do our best to get the form, if the form is submitted, it would show up as a, as a supplemental, yes. Yeah, challenging process for all parties concerned, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lepresti. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, item 11 is our Valley Homeless Health Care Program Report. Good after morning. We'll wait till you get your mic on. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you have about the Valley Homeless. What, will you start with your name and introduction oh, for Christine the record? I'm Christine Rouse, <laughs> Assistant Nurse Manager working with Valley Homeless Health Care Program. Good morning, supervisors. Good morning, thank you. I will look to my uh, colleagues for any questions. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. My notes say thank you, Paul, but you're not Paul, so let me just say <laughs> that right now. Um, while reviewing the 2023 Uniform Data System information, I noticed that of the 45,101 visits generated, 82% were medical services, while only 11% were mental health related. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? And, and I'm curious if, if there's a more significant overlap or if, yeah. Honestly, I would have to look at the data because um, it's throughout the whole county of Santa Clara, um, not just within Valley Homeless Healthcare Program, so we can get back to you on that. What, and let me just say what the what the goal that I'm what I'm trying to better understand is uh, how the the connection based on the the need that we're seeing is happening um, to in terms of connecting people to the actual behavioral health services because that number now the the number just seems a little low on that side of the aisle and so one of the questions that actually. Uh, President Ellenberg and I have been s struggling with in one of our committees is how many folks are actually accessing the, the second, um, you know, the referral component. So how many people are actually, are they getting behavioral health services directly when they're coming and is that what that's a reflection of or are those folks being referred uh, to mental health services? So at Valley Homeless Healthcare Program, we do have psychiatrists that work at our clinics. So we actually don't do a lot of referrals. We do same day access. Um, as for the referral based at other clinic sites, I would have to look more into that. So does that. this number, this 45,000, does if then, if, am I to read that, that 82% were receiving medical services and of all of those visits, only 11% were accessing mental health services. I think that's right. I would need to talk to the data an analyst as well, but I, I think that's what that is saying. I think it might be, if, it, if I would just request that we get an update on that off agenda, just so we understand the implications of those numbers, because I want to be able to digest them a little more. And if there's any sort of analysis that the staff wants to add, it would just be helpful in terms of, in terms of being able to place that in, in um, the overall context of the work that you're doing. And then if, if also if you could include under what terms and conditions folks would be referred and where they end up being referred. And part of the reason I'm curious about it is that we were just at um, Home First at the um, clinic mm -hmm. 
uh, there the other day, and I do know they have mental health, um, they have access to psychotropic medication that can be you know, administered. So I'm just wondering if, if our primary placement for people who are homeless who need, um, or referrals are primarily there, or if there's another partner. At all of our, all of our clinics with BHHP, we do have psychiatry available. Um, sometimes it may be remote, but we always we have it available at all of our access points with Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. So when we were taking a tour, um, they were sharing with us that there was some accessibility, and and this may have been my misunderstanding too that people were there two days a week. But what you're saying is that five days a week someone could get service. They just may not physically be in that Correct. location. Thank Correct. you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Supervisor Lee, then Arenas. <clears throat> thank you, President Ellenberg. I just want to also thank uh, VHSP staff and all your uh, team to, uh, for this uh, very informative report. Um, we have seen increase in our unhoused population, and I certainly know both the board and administration are working hard to try to find more ways to solve this. Uh, looking at the 2023 UDS summary data, um, noticing that we have collected some um, important demographic information, the patient characteristics, services, and quality indicators for over 7,500 unhoused patients. Um, and I think we might be able to have some potential to explore some data-driven improvements to service delivery for our unhoused residents, given this data that's been provided to us here today. Um, and I, I th think this would be able to help us really understand the bigger picture um, of why this increase is happening, how we could put a stop to it. Um, Despite the convenient sampling, since these data reflected the unhoused individuals who have been connected to VHXP, the, having a size, a sample size of 75, 25 is, is very, very large. Um, so this data will be very important, and so I'd like to ask um, the, whether the C, to request our administration um, to review the UDS uh, 2023 data and come back with recommendations to the board uh, at the May 21st board meeting uh, on how to improve our staffing for VHHP, uh, resource allocation, health outcomes, um, trying to identify any potential gaps in the care, and any thoughts on how these data may help us find more solutions for our broader homelessness issues. Is that doable? Yes. Thank you, Supervisor. Great. Lee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the, the report. And um, I just had a couple of notes here, um, particular, uh, particularly around the agricultural worker, um, which is 0.8%, which represents 61 people. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you, you serve um, South County from March to November through the Saludos Clinic. Does 61, is 61 the, the number of people that you serve through the Saludos Clinic? I think it's 60 to 80 um, patients. I also just want to note that Saludos goes from March to November, but we do have our Gilroy Mobile Medical Unit that we do year round once weekly that serves South County, and we also do our backpack once a week that um, goes to South County as well. Um, so I requested a off agenda report um, on 123 for an addition, for just so that I could have additional information on this um, particular item, which um, included the reduction in patients and a and, uh, breakdown of the agricultural farm worker, um, farm worker. So I, I, I think that's still missing and and by the way, uh, for, uh, for the administration, it's also missing from the board referral matrix. Um, so I'd like that to be included in there. Um, the, the other thing is that um, at, as the, one of the things that I think it, we're, I'm hoping to really maximize is enrollment to Medi-Cal since things have changed this year and folks who um, are undocumented can actually receive that. And so I'm hoping that you can work with our, um, our public health department to ensure, oh, no, not the, not the enrollment, 
social services agency so that we can have a higher enrollment in Medi-Cal and, and this be another way for um, folks in South County to actually receive um, medical services. As you, and I think it's wonderful that you continue to have the Saludos clina, Clinic. Um, I am just concerned that the the percentage is it's not even one percent; it's 0.8 percent um, that that has been served. And I know that there's a need out there, and so I want to make sure that um, I support you in, in whatever it is that is um, missing in order to have us um, connect with more. Um, more folks out there. And I know during the winter season, it's our unhoused are, are in um, the Ochoa camp, camp as well. And so there's an opportunity um, for those folks to get served. But in South County, I, I was particularly um, interested in, in the agriculture workers. Um, so if we can have that um, come back um, soon, and uh, I'd, I'd love to just have an offline conversation with you. Thank you, Supervisor Irene. We'll get you that off agenda item in the next 30 days. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, do we have public speakers on this item? We do not. Uh, may I get a motion to receive the report with the additional direction? Motion to uh, accept the report. Second. Thank you very much, let's vote please. Sorry, one moment while my system catches up. That was motion by Irene, second by Lee. Supervisor Reynas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Nellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you very much. Item 12, and just for a management purposes, my plan is to break from 12.30 to one. We'll, we'll go through as many items as we can before then. At one o'clock, we'll come back and go right to item 16, and then uh, finish up other items on the agenda. So item 12, please the public, uh, public view monitors and video intercoms surveillance use policy. Uh, are any of my colleagues interested in a presentation or would you like to go right to questions? Questions? You said presentation? Presentation always wins. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> hey, Doug. Director of Facility Security here to answer any questions about video intercoms or spot monitors. We'll hold the camera to you, Chuck. Supervisor Simidian. Move approval of the recommended action as Second. contained in, on page one of three in the report. Thank you, gathering there really was no presentation, so <laughs> that's fine. So we have a motion and a second. Supervisor uh, Chavez? I, I was ready to vote. Okay, Supervisor Menes, questions? Yes. Yes, questions, comments, or no? I thought we were <laughs> I love it, I love the efficiency. We'll get there super <laughs> soon. Do we have any public uh, speakers on this item? We do not. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Smidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. All right, excellent job, Mr. Feliciano. Uh, item 13 is the Ag Worker Housing Report. Good morning, Sylvia Gallegos, Deputy County Executive. In the interest of time, if you would like a quick presentation, it looks like we do, I'm happy to do so or respond to questions, and it sounds like you're ready to go. Yes, we're hearing yeses for, for a, a, a brief presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, as mentioned during the commendation for Dr. Jimenez, uh, staff is pleased to provide a report back to the two referrals uh, that have been made thus far, both on August 29th and December 5th. And I'm encouraged to report that a lot of work has been accomplished thus far with existing staff. And I wanted to spend a moment describing some of these items as well as foreshadowing upcoming work uh, that we hope to soon present to the board. So we have, um, 
as requested by the last referral, updated our overall initiative work plan to capture more of the um, important milestones, including uh, board funding and also um, other sub pertinent deadlines so that we can have some transparency and accountability with respect to the delivery of the work. We were also requested to provide a report, which we did in February, to, um, articulating the, stat the status of the San Martin campus with respect to its access to um, a sewer system and the improvements to those systems uh, from the city of Morgan Hill. And so that report was uh, presented and we're encouraged to add that, in fact, there is sufficient capacity and um, staff will continue to work with the city of Morgan Hill as we um, continue our programming of that particular campus. In addition, the planning and development department has embarked in quite a number of deliverables. Attached to the report is a planning submittal checklist, and while it looks like a small piece of work, actually it was an extensive amount of effort to reduce from 24 um, submittal checklists to four, including one focused on uh, residential applications and with the focus on ag worker um, applications. And this is a deliverable in advance of the work we will be commencing soon to what I describe as transform the development permitting process. In addition, you'll recall at your last board meeting, the Planning Development Department did bring forward the Farmland Security Zone Program and updates to the Williamson Act, again, with the intent to advance um, agriculture in Santa Clara County. And then they also prepared, and again, it looks like one sheet, and yet there was a significant amount of work to produce it, a summary of 15 development applications for ag worker housing, and we're prepared to discuss those projects at Hewlett on Thursday. In addition, there was a request to uh, identify the resources necessary to perform this work, and staff is always appreciative when the board recognizes that sometimes we do need additional resources, so at mid-year, we did make a request uh, for $300,000 for consultant support for that permitting transformation process I described. And uh, we're finalizing the scope now, hope to get it um, in the marketplace by early April and uh, commence that very significant body of work. In addition, uh, for the recommended budget, we uh, will be incorporating a request for the Ag permitting ally position in the Department of Planning and Development, and also a reserve for pilot programs, which we are still exploring. And I should um, take a moment now to recognize some of my colleagues here at the dais, including David Bruno. And I'm not sure if we're able now to project the presentation. And in addition, uh, there we go. And in addition, Aaron Forbath, who's um, a deputy county council that has supported us on not only the pilot projects, but also on the uh, proposed bill that's been um, authored by uh, Assemblymember Pellegrin. Next slide. And at this moment, I would uh, turn your attention to my colleague, David Campos. I think he may be still in training. And so I would merely offer that, as I just stated, there was a bill uh, AB 3035 that was introduced and additional language was um, made available, I believe, on Friday. And the intent really is to extend the reach of the 2019 Farm Worker Housing Act by uh, Speaker Rivas. And uh, currently, as the legislation is structured, it would be a pilot involving Santa Clara County, Santa Cruz County, and I was recently apprised um, San Mateo County is interested in this pilot, which in effect would allow us to expand on a streamlined ministerial process to uh, site ag worker housing. And in particular, we're trying to extend the reach so that it could also incorporate um, cities in addition to these unincorporated areas. Because as we repeatedly say, we want dense housing in the urban areas where you have access to water and sewer and other important services. 
In addition, we're very pleased to report um, we had made a, um, I'll call it an earmark request, I think it's called community funding request now, uh, about a year ago. And we recently learned that uh, Representative Lofkin was able to secure $1.6 million for what we describe as our farm worker housing rehab and electrification program. It's intended to help property owners that may have existing uh, violations that relate to health and safety, principally water and sewer, electrical and plumbing, be able to take advantage of these grants if they would participate in our program. So we would offer them amnesty and use these grants to help them bring uh, these things up to code. And so we will be um, receiving word soon when we can receive the funding. As I stated in the report, our hope is to use that, um, that ag permitting ally position because it's not a code enforcement person and probably be better received in the community and that it really is the point of the ally to um, help us develop the program and oversee it. Next slide. Upcoming deliverables, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are finalizing the scope uh, for a consultant to help us on the transformation of the permitting process. And um, I'm hoping we can get this out in the field by April. In addition, uh, we are finalizing our work on the Ag Worker Housing Surveys, which is building on the work in 2018 to update and better inform the housing needs. This time, we are um, going to survey, in addition to farmers and farm labor contractors, farm workers, and that uh, is challenging, it's a hard to reach population. We have permanent uh, farm workers, we have seasonal farm workers. The seasonal can be um, H2A, they can be non-H2A, some can be represented by labor and others don't. And so we've had extensive number of meetings with UFW, County Office of Ed, we're meeting with St. Joseph Family Service Center and other um, trusted nonprofits to to design um, the survey instrument. For example, with the UFW, you know, they are willing to partner with us and give us access to their email list so we can push out a survey. But we're finalizing the design. Our intent, particularly with the farm workers, is to execute this during the peak harvest season, which is later in the summer, so we can maximize the potential participation and get really rich data. Next slide. Uh, in addition, um, we are further reviewing our general plan policies. In the referral, there was an interest in exploring what was identified in the 2022, um, I think it's Farm Worker Housing Toolkit by ABAG, and we have reviewed unincorporated parcels that are adjacent to South County cities for the opportunity to potentially extend municipal services to unincorporated areas. So. We've um, reviewed additionally 30 parcels that we had originally reviewed for the housing element but excluded and um, have reviewed uh, quite a number, of probably over a dozen general plan policies. We're reviewing LAFCO policies, city policies, and hope in the next couple of months to engage LAFCO to understand if there's an opportunity to have city county agreements with Gilroy and Morgan Hill so that in fact if there were development just outside city boundaries, whether there would be interest to extend city services um, to those projects. And then OSH is poised to issue a request for offers for the 8th and Alexander site, which is an incorporated Gilroy, which was an old um, roads department uh, incorporation yard. And um, the intent is to build affordable housing, including ag worker housing. And then we are in FAF with all of our partners, including OSH, CEO, and others, uh, will be commencing on the planning for the San Martin Highland Campus. There have been some initial discussions between OSH and the FAF planners about the potential siting of an ag worker housing project on that particular campus. Next slide. And then we're available to respond to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Fantastic. If it's all right uh, with my colleagues, I'd like to go first to public comment and then back to all of you. Do we have speakers on this item? I do have one hand on Zoom. No cards in the room. 
Okay, just a, a note that we'll close the queue when this first speaker begins speaking. So if anyone else is on Zoom and wishes to speak, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. We'll give that a few seconds and then close the queue. Okay, holding at one, we'll take Sharon Luna for two minutes. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Supervisor Sharon Luna from the San Martin Neighborhood Association. I would just like to ask that the San Martin Neighborhood Association and other organizations in the South County are involved uh, in regard to the Highland uh, campus being um, redeveloped for um, farm worker housing. Um, I want to ensure that there is um, public comments uh, in regard to how this project will uh, be developed, unlike our involvement in the animal center, where we were basically told um, what would be done and had no input in regard to um, how it was going to be developed. When we use the word transparency, that means that everyone should have a voice and um, whether or not you accept our recommendations or not, we still have a voice in how this will go down. Um, we do have several homes around the area and um, it is uh, a concern as far as how um, the development will uh, impact some of the homes in the area. So it, I would like to ask that you do include organizations such as the San Martin Neighborhood Association and also involve the San Martin um, Planning Advisory Committee. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much, Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, I want to first start off by just congratulating you, Sylvia for your leadership on this, and of course, um, your team, uh, David, and um, as well as Aaron. I, I'm just absolutely um, over the moon here with, with, with the results that we've seen today. And this is really, um, you know, I, I, I think it just brings uh, your expertise and your leadership um, into play with, with uh, policy and it, and lessons learned from the past by doing this work. You've done this work before. You've done the surveys before. You've y you you know this community and you know what the difficulties are in with the regulatory um, issues that we all that we are facing. That you're all been um, probably having lots and lots of headaches about um, at the end of the day. Um, and then coming up with some answers, right? Trying to really brainstorm about. How do we get this done, um, irregardless of those barriers? And so I just want to congratulate you on, on all of this really, really um, wonderful work that you've presented to us. And I just uh, want to reiterate some of the work that you're doing because I know that you did a quick presentation, but but I just want to tell our our uh, my colleagues that the level of outreach that they will be conducting is. Um, so comprehensive, we we recognize, and you recognize most most importantly, that there's different kinds of farm workers out in in South County, right? Those are the um, the folks who are um, in the flower industry who might be more of um, Asian descent, and so you're bringing in different kind of language capacity in order for us to engage with those um, farm workers. We understand, of course, they're seasonal farm workers as well as, and, and um, H2A workers as well as those who are living in our, in our South County um, and might have different kinds of housing issues. And so I really wanna just thank you for not only just recognizing the diversity of our farm workers, but also being responsive to them. And the kind of work that you are going to do is, is, is kind of uh, what I would say um, when we were going through the, um, when we're going through the pandemic and we needed to connect with the most difficult 
um, to connect kind of populations, I would say that you know you're you're you have a challenge in front of you, and so um, I'm offering my support and help with my team as well as those folks who are out in South County who can help um, facilitate all of this work for um, for us. And so thank you for for that. the The other piece is this, you know the the. Um, the potential agreements that need to happen between city and county, these are all things that are just um, details that need to get sorted out. And I know that you've um, alluded to the ABAG toolkit for farm, worker, um, farm workers, and then also, of course, working with LAFCO on, on some of those policies. And so there's so much that needs to get done before we actually even take a step in the right direction so that we can get it right. Um, the other pieces are, and, and, and while doing all of that, um, you had uh, that um, community funding request to um, Congresswoman O'Loughran, and I also heard about the 1.6 million in the electrification and um, the amnesty uh, or rehabilitation program. So there's, there's so many really great aspects of this work happening at the same time. Um, as and then, colleagues, because I know that you're just <laughs> enthralled in all of this <laughs> update, um, because the, the other thing that, that this team is doing and that we recognize collectively is that we might need to have some legislative support. And there has been a lot of barriers and obstacles, and you're very um, gracious in, in your report, Sylvia, but I've got to say that it is absolutely infuriating when you're, when I, when I recognize some of the difficulties in, in getting, I think, um, really noble legislation um, over the finish uh, line, and and so I just want to thank you and congratulate you, and and of course I don't know if David Campos is here, but oh, wow, he just walked through. What a grand <laughs> entrance! <laughs> Did you time that? <laughs> I sent him a text a minute ago. <laughs> um, the kind of work that needs to get done on a policy level, a legislative level, and the work that you are all coordinating is just absolutely um, um, intense and, um, and work that actually really needed to get done to, to just offer some of the basics for, for our community, which, which is, which is um, housing, um, because I know that right now we recognize there's some very deplorable housing um, environments for our agricultural workers. If we think that, um, we know we, we, we don't. We really don't know. And so um, I'm really grateful for um, Dr. Jimenez, who came in earlier and who has led his whole life in, in uh, raising those issues of, of our migrant and immigrant communities and the realities of what um, farm workers bring to this country. Um, so I, I was, David, I was going on and on about all the really good work <laughs> in this report um, that, that Sylvia just really eloquently went through like in less than five minutes, but I just said, no, I'm gonna extend this and really detail all of this work out because it, it deserves this kind of attention. The work that you've all been doing for the past year is just absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, what I was just moving into, be, aside from having um, us just reiterate the outreach that needs to take place and the work plan that um, has been composed and is being followed as, and um, bringing somebody on board, um, to make sure that we get even the pamphlets right um, so that when we distribute information to those farmers that they can really understand what we're asking them to do and that we're all in the effort of streamlining a process for, farm, for farmers in order to get housing for farm workers. And so um, I know that there's you know, it really great information about the sewer expansion project in San Martin Highland campus. We talked about the a bag toolkit for the farm worker um, housing. We were just going over, um, oh, and then of course the, the management consulting that I just alluded to for the permitting, permitting process transformation. I, I'm really impressed that it's coming back in April for the, um, and, and looking forward to that. 
And, and then we were getting to the legislative update, and this is something that I know that you've been working directly on, uh, David, and I'm just um, absolutely grateful f um, for, for your work and, and for you being so relentless. This, this group right here is just absolutely relentless and, and taking no, um, and not taking no um, as an answer. And so one of the things that uh, David has done is really worked with um, our folks, and I, you know, and I, I shouldn't just say you. I know that there's a team behind you as well. Um, but we are expanding um, Speaker Rivas's um, farm worker uh, bill from 2019, which hasn't really rendered very much housing throughout the state of California. I mean, I think very, very little, if any. And, and what we're doing is, is hoping to densify uh, near areas that um, have access to city services um, or county services for, for that matter, but, um, but services nonetheless, sewer and water, which is the most important, so that we can ha create more access. Um, and then it hopefully entice um, some affordable housing developers or uh, other developers into investing into in, in these areas. And I'm really grateful that you were able to uh, bring in a couple of counties with us uh, that we can pilot this, we can show the rest of California that this, this can actually be done and encourage everybody else to do that as well. And so um, I, I know that I'm saying this, I, I know I'm t I've taken my time in, in saying this and, I'm, and the reason I'm doing this is because um, it, all of this work, in the meantime, while we get this wonderful you know, policy um, or legislation passed, and hopefully everything will, will, will work, and we'll ask our colleagues to um, support a, a letter of support um, in just a minute, but in, in the meantime, we have an application, um, or we have applications, 15 applications currently, that can create a total of 147 units. And so in the past, we've had four units in the last, like three units, excuse me, because it had to be reduced from four to three. Three units in the past, like four years. And so to have 179 new potential units is just absolutely amazing to me. Um, so thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I'm going to make a motion to not only approve the report, um, but so that we can have some additional direction um, for administration and county council. So the first one being to direct administration to prioritize the po pilot program section of the work plan to ensure that the programs are ready for initial launch at the time that the federal funding becomes available. I'm sure that you're all working hard to do that anyways, but um, nonetheless. And then of course, direct administration to work to secure additional letters of support for Assembly Member Gail Pellerin's AB 3035 bill, which is uh, the Assembly Member who's carrying this, this bill. And uh, continue conducting outreach to other counties beyond Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, and San Mateo. That's included in the bill. Um, uh, lastly, to direct administration to report to Hewlett on options to provide farm workers with services while they're participating in answering county surveys and exploring utilizing SSA outreach staff as well as possible partnerships with Santa Clara Family Health Plan outreach and enrollment workers. And this has, has something to do with the report you just heard um, in an effort to increase Medi-Cal enrollment. Go ahead. You have a question. When you're done. Oh, I'm done. So, yeah. I, I, would love before you get an answer, would be really honored to second your motion. Oh, I think this you. is incredibly exciting um, work. I'm a little bit blown away by how much you're accomplishing in your beginning of your second year on the board. Um, we have in. accomplished it's because what, what you all, we but but truly your your leadership is is quite um, quite astounding. Not that's terrible. Quite uh, impressive here. So glad to second that work. I only wanted to comment that I would be utterly remiss if I didn't acknowledge the very large team, not only here, but also in planning, in FAF, in um, sustainability, in SEPA, who are doing all this work. I'm just presenting the work they're doing. And importantly, I also need to acknowledge the full support of the county executive and all of this work, including uh, funding some of these initiatives and also county council. Thank you. And lastly, I'm gonna include my team 
<laughs> and and point out Patrick, who has um, um, just been absolutely fabulous in in following. You know, there's there's things that that we do that um, are motivated um, uh, by dreams that that we have, and I've got to tell you that this has been a dream for me. Since I was in high school, I went to Independence High School, and the theater there was named Luis Valdez. And Luis Valdez is, is a writer um, that joined Cesar Chavez's movement, I, I mean, not his movement, but the farm worker movement, and would conduct mitos and actos, and those are just short plays in order to engage farm workers in, um, into the strikes and into the, um, the UFW um, work, and and I always dream from from that day. How, how can I ever support farm workers? And it has been something that has been um, a, a dream of mine. And so, so thank you so much for for helping this girl's dream to to work on policy. That is just absolutely so meaningful to me. Um, not only because it was a dream as a young girl, but because my dad was a bracero and my, my mother picked strawberries and my oldest siblings did as well. And so I know the hard work um, that our farm workers um, give our community and, and they deserve a place to sleep at night. Thank you so, thank so you. much, uh, Supervisor Arenas. I'm gonna, um, if possible, I'm, I'm suspecting you've got very broad support here. Hoping to wrap this by 12.30, if that is feasible for my colleagues. We'll see if it is. Supervisor Chavez, then Samidi, and then Lee. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, congratulations. This is very exciting and well, well done. There are a lot of people who are proud of you today, Sylvia. Um, I, I have two kind of basic questions, and then I have a third question that's a little more um, robust. One is, as we're doing the 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 work on the, um, you know, sewer and water. Can we include broadband? I didn't, and and the reason that's important is as we were talking about the equity um, broadband plan. But one of the challenges we have is children and adults having access to broadband, and I think we need to be thinking about sewer, water, broadband. Like I don't think they're, yeah. and electricity. Like they're, it's just one of the elements. Yes. Is that doable? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. And then the second question um, along those, those same lines is when the, have, are we looking at um, sources of funds, and, I, and this may, may not be a great idea, but what I'm really thinking about is under what circumstances we can access rehab dollars. And what I'm actually thinking about is the um, the body of work that if, if BAFA's bill goes through and we do have some sort of a, a, bond, um, a bond come through, whether or not we can make sure that farm worker housing is included in that. And what I would request is that our, our, our housing department, Sylvia, in partnership with you, um, send an inquiry to the, um, you know, to MTC just asking about the, the flexibility around those funds. And part of the reason for that is that the, there's a, a large, a rather large section of that money that would be available presumably for rehab. But I, I don't know the condition, and I think um, Supervisor Adonis raised a great point about the, the, the construction types being different, what it is being different, and I just wanna make sure we're not losing an opportunity to access a resource. We're happy to do that research and then report back at Hewlett or through an off-agenda memo. You know, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I, if you could do off-agenda and through Hewlett, and the off-agenda would be helpful for me just because I sit on the MTC board and I, and I know we have two ABAG We're members, both on right? ABAG, yeah. yeah, so if we Let's could get off-agenda. Just confirm that that works for the maker of the motion. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, right. Just had to get it on the record. It works um, for the second year as well. And then lastly, um, this is more of a question about the the um, the process by which uh, or, uh, organizations get a grace get grace a grace period. You know, I, I, what and what I mean is that if if in fact there's amnesty for folks who are making repairs. Um, are there, is there flexibility around 
um, when amnesty, I, I mean, I know we don't like flexibility, we wanna be consistent, but what I'm really trying to understand is, is there an opportunity for um, you as a staff that's learning a little bit about what the needs are to reconstruct the amnesty framework based on what you're learning in real time? So we haven't prepared the program guidelines yet, but we will take that into account. And generally speaking, I would say that if as we start the program, we find that the rules either don't um, advance you know, our objectives or require other changes, we can make changes to them to adjust to that. I think what I would just wanna ask is if we can have a real time, like if we can give ourselves a real time mechanism for that kind of change since this is a new program, and if at any point it's in a pilot phase um, that we have that ability to, to be responsive. And, and let me just tell you the problem I'm trying to solve is that um, it's been so long since attention has been paid to this, this topic that I think we're gonna discover what people are currently using as, as housing. And what I wanna be mindful of is that our, our preconceived notions don't stop us from being able to say, yes, we can move on amnes amnesty in this box if the following outcomes are achieved. And, and that it also just makes me interested in determining whether or not there's a, um, as we acquire resources as they become available, how those resources get applied in a, in a prioritized way, whether or not that is um, the type of housing, the number of units, or the, or the speed. And this is actually the really important question that, that I would want to make sure that Hewlett dives into, which is you may decide that you want that you're gonna prioritize speed over, mm -hmm. over anything else because it allows for housing. And just as a reminder with Measure A, there were many, many things we were trying to achieve, but the main thing we were after was how fast could we get these units built? And for some period of time, that may actually be the priority versus a, of a certain type. But I, I just wanna make sure that discussions had publicly after there's enough information. And that's why I was thinking that the ability to um, respond more quickly may give you may give you the ability to come back to the board and say, you know, we're we're using this framework, but we want to proceed in a different direction. We can we will and uh, happy to engage the board as we develop the program guidelines and any of the forums and respond to questions. And also just making sure that the board's aware of the housing, I mean, I'm sorry, of the funding resources that, that may become available that, that may drive actually some of the prioritization. That's, that's really what I wanna get to. Great, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you, I, I just wanted to follow up uh, on the legislative piece I know there was some conversation with uh, folks at the United Farm Workers who had concerns initially about the bill. How did that all get resolved? It sounds to me like it did, so I'm hoping that that's the case. Sure. Yes, through the chair, uh, Supervisor Samidian, uh, the, the concern that had been raised had to do with the funding and the question of whether or not state funds would be used for the foreign worker program. Uh, their concern being that they wanted to make sure that any housing that was built for foreign workers would be uh, would come out of the pockets of the the farmers that are bringing those workers uh, and that would not be using state funds and this legislation doesn't really deal with that issue and we clarify that and we included language that makes it clear that any concern around that uh, it's not really impacted by this um, so, you know, uh, our understanding from our conversations with them is that they're satisfied on that note. Uh, they, they had other concerns, uh, but uh, we're still working with them on, on any issue, and right now they're basically, basically taking a neutral position, which is different from what they had indicated where they were thinking of opposing. And, you know, that's one thing that I would say about this landscape there are a lot of players, uh, a lot of reasons why things haven't moved. And, and we do believe, going back to what Supervisor Arena said, is that this effort will really be the first one, if we're successful, to move the needle in terms of actually building housing. And we're very mindful of all of the concerns that, that players like UFW have raised. And we're doing everything we can to address them. And 
you know, for the time being, uh, it seems like they're satisfied, but we will keep you posted if that changes. Uh, but the specific issue that they raise, we address. Thank you. Let me follow up questions, uh, if I may, through the chair. Um, is the bill that we're being asked to support currently in print uh, yes. with the language that you've described? Yes. Yes, and we're happy to provide a copy of that of that to to the board. Uh, it it just uh, came out at the end of last week. Okay, and do we know whether the farm workers um, and other stakeholders? Well, I'll I'll make the question specific: whether they are in support, oppose, or neutral on the bill as it now exists in print. Right now, they are neutral, and what UFW indicated to us is that they were unlikely to be supportive of, of any bill, that they have other priorities, and that their only action would be uh, an opposition, and at this point, uh, they're, they're neutral. Uh, I, one thing that I would also say, that another player that, that has had some say here is the rural counties. Uh, which expressed the concern about having a statewide bill that essentially required all counties, all 58 counties, to, to go down this path, which is why the bill has been framed uh, targeting uh, pilot programs in, in Santa Clara County and other counties that are interested, and so far it's uh, Santa Cruz and San Mateo. Well, I absolutely want to be supportive, and I'm, I'm going to be an I vote on the item uh, about which I'm delighted, but I, I also want to make sure that we don't um, have a problem that could be avoided uh, any time in the foreseeable future. Um, so could, uh, if the maker and the seconder are amenable, could we ask that um, the motion include, could I ask that the motion include direction to staff to provide us with a copy of the bill uh, and a copy of the support and oppose list? and uh, direction to staff to continue to work with interested stakeholders, including but not limited to the f folks at the United Farm Workers uh, to ensure the greatest degree possible of um, support for the bill and lack of opposition as well. Okay, is that? So you said direction, of, uh, direction to administration to provide a copy of the bill as well as the uh, opposition? Support and opposition. Support. And what was this, the second part of that? The direction was to continue to work with all of the stakeholders, including but not limited to the UFW. I, uh, I think that's already included in that. I, I don't want to call out the UFW because I don't want to recognize them as being pivotal in whether this gets done or not, but um, I'm I sorry, appreciate I'm, I'm the I'm having feedback. trouble understanding the speaker system. Did not want to call them out because I don't want it to be determined by UFW. I think it's al they're already being engaged by David um, and the rest of the staff as the, the reason why this is a pilot and not a statewide is because of some of the opposition and because we've been they've been working in order for this to actually happen. So I don't know that I need to provide further direction in, in this motion for them to actually do what they've been already been doing, which is working with the UFW and the rural counties um, associations. If the maker and the seconder won't accommodate the request, I'm uh, that's their prerogative. I'm certainly going to still vote for the motion. So let me ask a couple of follow up questions, though, with that in mind, please. Um, absent that direction. Will you continue to work with all stakeholders, including but not limited to the UFW? Absolutely, through the chair, absolutely, Supervisor Semidian, we will continue to work as we have, uh, and you know, we'll continue to keep them apprised of where the bill is. Uh, so you have that commitment, and that's the direction we got from our county executive as well. Yeah, I only call them out because they have been in touch with my office, and that's a function of the fact that I worked closely with them from. 2004 to 2012 during my tenure in the state senate. Um, th I am certainly mindful of the fact that there are a host of other interested parties and stakeholders and uh, to sort of underscore the kudos that you've already been given. Uh, it was my experience that whenever you tried to tinker with anything that dealt with housing policy, the, the stakeholders were 
numerous uh, who were always anxious about you know what any change in the process would be. So um, I'll simply ask my staff, and I see that I have staff here, to stay in touch with you as the bill moves through the system uh, and to uh, assess the uh, status of the bill, including the support and opposition list, um, which doesn't determine what any one of us might think about the bill, but uh, could be a red flag along the way. Hopefully there are no red flags. Thank you. And Thank I'm, you. I'd I'm happy to, to include that, that first part of your, of your request. Thank you um, for that. Supervisor. Thank you. Um, we're trying to adhere to the request that we start item 16 at 1. So I'm going to go to Supervisor Lee for um, brief comments and then come Very to brief, all uh, of us for a vote. Yeah, just first of all, I want to thank our um, staff for the great work that you've been put together. This is a lot of great body of work, and thank you for your leadership, uh, uh, Supervisor uh, Arenas, for this. It really, uh, really means a lot to, uh, honestly, thousands of people for many, many years to come. I also want to say, say a great kudos to our own Congresswoman Lofgren for leading the farm worker housing rehab and electrification yeah. pilot program, securing the $1.67 million to help rehab these long overdue repairs for basic water, sanitation, sewage, and other poor living conditions that, honestly, we can't even imagine right here in Silicon Valley. Uh, we certainly need to outreach in different languages to farmers and farm workers to take advantage of these funds ASAP. Uh, the report talks about uh, languages, including Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese. I just want to make sure that we are outreaching to any other, like Vietnamese, Tagalog, uh, many of the farm workers. So I just want to make sure that uh, gets into the, the, this work. And thank you very much for the awesome work. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with five. Thank you. With that, we will recess until 1.05, 30 minutes.
Good afternoon. We're at 106, and we will reconvene as just as soon as we have a quorum on the dais. Oops. All right, welcome back. Uh, Jess, will you take a roll call, please? I will. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Vice President Lee? Definitely present. President Ellenberg? I am here as well. Thank you, you have a quorum of five. As requested, we're going to go directly to item 16, uh, which will be followed by 15 and then 17. Sure, we're going to item 16, which was the time request, time search and request for the DFCS item, and we'll then go back to 15 and finish up with 17. So who do we have presenting on item 16? Please come on down. I will be presenting oh, on item 16. Just give me a minute. Okay. I have just a couple of quick slides to help walk through the presentation. So we were asked at the December 19th uh, Board of Supervisors special meeting um, as part of a separate item for administration to come back with a report regarding some analysis associated with uh, the potentiality of separating DFCS out from the social services agency. I wanted to just begin with a quick overview and talk about the couple pieces of that report. Um, first, I, I think it's important to begin with with some of the, I think the shared the shared goals and the shared concerns that come out from the discussions there and elsewhere that we've been having together regarding DFCS. And that's foremost a shared goal from the board and administration to keep children across our county safe from abuse and neglect and ensure that DFCS is implementing best practices as an important step to accomplish that goal. And I think we share the following concerns, that there's a clear and shared understanding of current policies, practices, and associated outcomes, that there's enhanced oversight to ensure policies and practices center child safety and align with best practice and legal requirements, that we are supporting staff and doing excellent social work in a supportive departmental culture and that we're advancing comprehensive and thorough implementation of all needed policy reforms and practice improvements. To that end, there's many steps already underway, including those that have been separately reported on um, in, as part of the now quarterly reports to the board uh, and with the creation of an ad hoc committee by the board. Uh, one piece of that is a, a full review of all current DFCS policies and practices and also uh, to identify um, additional internal leadership support, external experts, and as part of this report, also analyzing the possibility of removing DFCS from SSA. 
was outlined in the first uh, part of the report that the board has. Uh, we, we came back as requested by the board with a number of recommendations associated with providing enhanced support uh, for DFCS, including, as outlined in the report, some specific recommendations of entities and individuals that, that uh, would be able to provide additional external assistance in the reviews that are underway and, and in expanding the scope of those, including some of the state's partners in the work that the state has um, been doing through CDSS with California uh, Child Welfare Departments across the state. And in addition, administrations designated uh, Deputy County Executive Casey Alcon to comprehensively coordinate implementation of these recommendations and activities from the Office of the County Executive. Also as requested uh, by the board, uh, we conducted an, an assessment uh, of uh, the possible removal of DFCS from the Social Services Agency. We, we did this in, in a couple different elements. Uh, one is to look at what other counties in California are doing. Of the 58 counties in California, 57 have a model similar to ours where the DEBS and DFCS functions are joined. Uh, LA County is the only one that has a different model where child welfare is separated as an independent department, which has been the case in LA since 1984. Um, we also conducted a fiscal analysis, which is attached uh, to the item as well. Um, and while you know, it goes without saying that there's no price to put on the importance of child safety, that's something I think we can all agree on, uh, it's important to assess uh, what this looks like because it affects the investments that we can make in furthering uh, child welfare in our community. Um, and looking at that analysis, the biggest component is a $17.3 million um, revenue-related impact that's really associated with the fact that the federal government uh, reimburses DEBS-associated activity at a much higher percentage than DFCS-associated activity, and so having the functions combined uh, together in the same budget unit allows the drawdown of revenue in a much more advantageous manner that brings increased federal resources into our system. Um, the smaller component has to do with increased costs associated with um, having a separate uh, independent department and duplicative functions such as federal claiming as well as uh, accounting, budgeting, co contracting, and, and other similar activities for an ongoing uh, estimated impact of $22.1 million. Um, we recognize um, you know, that's all laid, laid out, of course, in the report. Recognize this is an initial assessment, but um, wanted to bring back to the board that information that we have gathered so far. Um, I think there are many different ways and approaches that we can take to providing the additional support that's needed to ensure thoughtful, thorough uh, implementation of the reforms that are being discussed as part of the, the board's quarterly uh, agendas, as part of the ad hoc committee's work. Um, and, you know, one where I think, um, you know, we can continue to ensure that we're drawing in as many resources as possible uh, in order to support uh, children in our community. So that's a quick summary of the report. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. I'd like to go first to public for comment, and then I will come uh, Back to my colleagues. Do we have speakers in chambers or on Zoom? I do have seven cards in chambers and one hand on Zoom. Okay, let me remind everyone that I'll close the queue when the first speaker begins. So if anyone is in chambers wishing to speak, please go to the back of the room to get a yellow card. If I see folks moving back in that direction, I'll wait for a few minutes. And for anyone on Zoom, the the queue will also close when, when the first speaker begins speaking. So if you are on Zoom, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. We'll give a few seconds as well in case there are more, more uh, prospective speakers on Zoom. And when that number appears to be leveled off, we will close the queue and begin with speakers in chambers. Holding steady at seven in chambers, one on Zoom. Okay, then we will hold, we will close the queue with eight speakers and we are um, setting the clock for two minutes for each speaker. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our speakers will begin with Rico Mendez, followed by Lorena, followed by Andre, followed by Pa. If you could please form a line in the center. We'll start with Rico. Good afternoon, board members. Happy to be here again. Rico Mendez, Chief Elected Officer at SEIU Local 521. It's been a heartening process over the last two weeks engaging directly with the county at a pretty high level on trying to find some really important solutions to something that we all care about clearly, which is protecting our children, protecting families, and trying to put them in an environment where they can thrive even in the most difficult or sometimes dangerous situations. There's a few items in particular that we've really, through the uh, course of talking and listening to the workforce that does the work every day on the ground, the social workers represented by SEIU 521 and the social worker supervisors are some examples. We've really learned a lot. We've shared this with the county and we've made some recent progress on moving forward with some ideas that we think could help find some solutions and some changes that could help the children. One, we've been directly engaging with the county every two weeks and the department heads and that's been a helpful dialogue. It started off kind of rough, but it's gotten better over the last couple of meetings. And we've moved forward, and I think coming to an agreement that frontline social workers do need to be in the conversation at every single level in order to find the solutions that could stick. So we want to keep encouraging you as a board to support that. Another one is we do need to work on the staffing issue. It is something real. It's nothing that we can fix overnight. It's not like there's an easy... Um, you know, easy, simple solution, but we do need to engage really seriously to find those solutions together, so we want to continue doing that. And we've also offered to do what's called empathy interviews through the union, but in coordination with the county, and we will be proceeding with interviewing, I believe, 30 or so social workers and 10 of the supervisors, deep one-hour interviews to gather information on potential solutions. The last one I'll end with is getting those social workers and supervisors back in the conversation of whether or not to remove a child from a home. It's absolutely critical to get them back in that conversation as soon as possible. We've heard from the county that you're interested in doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is Pa Chang, and I'm a social work supervisor, and I'm also the chief steward for all supervisors and social services analysts. I'm here today um, with the agenda item you know, my comment is while this is Social Work Appreciation Month and I appreciate the continued collaboration and trying to work with management on some of these items, there's still some misses in that um, the workforce still does not, um, are not given feedback in terms of who these external individuals are that is going to be doing a much deeper dive into DFCS. Um, with regards to tools that we are currently using in terms of evident change that is being mentioned and the SDM tools, we are utilizing those. However, we would like to have more clarity in terms of the specific focus that those items are going to be utilized and how that's going to be effective with our future work. Um, in terms of what is occurring right now on the floor with the workforce, we still have a lot of misses and concerns in terms of our communication with executive management, in terms of the amount of removals that are occurring with our dependency intake. We, within two months, we are at full capacity. We're going over standard. So there's concern there that in two months, we have a high level of removals and intervention. Uh, we are non-court progress. Um, there is no auditing of its efficacy or its efficiency in terms of our intervention at a voluntary level with families in the community. Our child abuse hotline continues to have issues in terms of calls not being answered. We're getting referrals 15 days out when an allegation of abuse or neglect are being made. We are concerned about our retention and staff support. Thank you so much. Do we have Lorena Briones in Chambers? Or Andre Patron? Alex Lesniak? We'll go to Frederick Ferrer, followed by Amanda Kennedy.
Good afternoon, members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Frederick Ferrer, CEO of Child Advocates of Silicon Valley. Um, I wanted to speak to the memo itself in a couple of different ways. Um, certainly agreeing with um, the county exec on the common goals or values that we share, both in the safety of children, but also in the preservation and reunification of families. Um, we wouldn't support the move to uh, remove DFCS from SSA, not only for the money reason, but also for, um, we don't see that the need for transparency, there's got to be better alternatives than um, to reduce the resources in a stress system al already. Um, in terms of the second piece around a holistic assessment, we'd also recommend that, that there needs to be very specific tasks to be reviewed, a tight timeline and process, and the ability for the justice partners in the community to weigh in on what that process would look like, and then the report back not only to the board, but from an accountability perspective, what is this going to mean? What, what's actually going to happen uh, by having these outside um, folks kind of review uh, process and procedures within the department? And then finally, um, and we de I definitely think that the county exec's office being the coordinator can be really helpful in that process. Um, and then finally, I would say really the willingness that we have as child advocates to help in any way that we can in terms of how do we help make the system better? Um, what's the role that CASAS could play um, not only in the, in the safety features of the department, but also in the family preservation side. And we stand ready to work collaboratively with the department as we continue to look at how do we improve this system for all children. Good afternoon, my name is Amanda Kennedy and I'm a supervising attorney at Legal Advocates for Children and Youth. We are the attorney team that represents most of the children and youth in the court-involved child welfare system. We are in support of engaging stakeholders to review DFCS policy and practice, as well as the appointment of Deputy County Executive uh, Casey Halcone to coordinate those reform efforts. And like Mr. Farrar, we would also put our organization forward to assist these efforts in any way that we can be helpful. We would love to share our observations and expertise as our system works to provide the best possible services to children and families in our community. We would also note that it's our understanding that CDSS is currently conducting its child and family services review, which includes a county self-assessment and input from stakeholders, and which results in a system improvement plan. And we're curious about how this CDSS process will overlap with our other local efforts to review the policies at DFCS and determine how to move forward. A lot of effort is being put into um, ensure safety and support for our families, and we would all benefit from sharing information about each of these efforts across departments, across teams, and also with the public. Thank you. Last call for Lorena or Andre or Alex. That concludes speakers and chambers. We'll go to Zoom. Our speaker is Katie. Katie, you'll have two minutes. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Katie Joe, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Dependency Advocacy Center, which is the organization that provides legal representation, representation to parents and some children in dependency court. Um, we also work in a preventative capacity with families in the community at risk of formal child welfare system involvement. Um, I have submitted a written public comment on this item on behalf of our organization, but wanted to briefly summarize those points uh, before you engage in discussion today. Like our colleagues at CASA and Lacey, we do welcome the input of outside experts and are familiar with the individuals and agencies listed in the executive report. Um, we would also echo their ask that even as a board and county administration seek out these expert voices, um, that you would continue to incorporate as well the voices of county community partners who are doing this work on a daily basis, including those of us who are here today um, and those of us who are not. I would also like to build on union leadership's call um, to incorporate more voices into the decision-making process, not only social workers on the ground, um, but also the voices of people with actual experience in these systems, both parents and children who are deeply affected by the outcomes of these policy discussions. 
Um, we would oppose at this time the recommendation to remove DFCS from SSA. Um, we believe there are better ways to achieve oversight of DFCS and particularly ways that are more cost effective, which is really crucial at a time of budget deficit where we're seeing our most vulnerable families struggle to access much needed services. Um, we would really encourage the board to consider ways we can um, continue to work together and collaborate to support those families in community. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. I'll start with Supervisor Arenas. Hi, um, thank you so much for the report and thank you for the speakers for giving us their insight um, and your feedback um, as you are all working with families who are directly impacted and so I'm absolutely grateful um, for that. I know in uh, the December 19th hearing that Supervisor Travis and I um, uh, and the rest of the board, we all hosted here um, removing DFCS out of SSA was one of the options. And the reason for that wasn't because we want to um, create any uh, fiscal implications that will harm overall the work that is being done by DFCS, but it's really to create um, a closer collaboration and work with the Board of Supervisors. Um, as, as you all know, we um, weren't aware of some of the work or, or some of the review and the reports that be, were being conducted by um, the California Department of Social Services. And so it, it really is important to me, and I won't speak for the board, but it's really important for me um, to have um, the latest information to know what is happening on the ground and to be able to be a partner to our um, DFCS department so that we can, as counterparts uh, of policy, complete meaningful and um, objective policy that will move um, the department forward and as well as respect and, and honor the, the safety and well-being of our children in, in this community. And so um, with that, uh, Supervisor Travis and myself um, wrote a, a legislative file that is in response to the department's report. Um, and I, I've got to say that I, I just, I'm really grateful that, that the department, that the administration is thinking about um, having a very holistic approach in um, reviewing their um, their policies and procedures, and and I know that you are um, in tune with with what we are saying. Um, I think that with some of what I heard, not only from the speakers but from just collecting information from our stakeholders on the ground, they they have a, a real earnest <laughs> um, need to participate. And so we need to figure out a way to fold them in. And this is one of the ways, um, when, if you refer to, the, to our, our memo, uh, which the subject is consider recommendations relating to oversight of DFCS, um, there's a couple of options here for us. Um, and one of which is it just overall, we, we want to make sure that there is, um, an ongoing um, an ongoing um, engagement of all of the stakeholders um, that you heard from today um, that represent some of the agencies that you heard from today but um, for those folks who are doing the work on the ground within our own department and I think that really is important for us at this point because this is where some of the breaking points are. And um, the first part of the recommended action is to direct the administration to ensure that DFCS work plan outcomes and recommendations presented to the board are a product that has received participation and feedback from a diverse group of stakeholders. Um, and I think that's what you heard um, in terms of, of feedback. I don't think that's anything new. Um, and so what 
what we would like to do is to just put on hold the, the holistic policy and practice review and recommendations from external experts so that we can get that feedback from the community, so we can get that feedback from the stakeholders, from the folks who are representing the children and families, um, whether they're advocates or um, the legal experts on the ground. We also would like to defer the recommended direction under, under item two, which is the potential removal of the DFCS from um, SSA. And I know this is something that that, w that we, oh, or I had suggested in, in December, um, in the effort to create more accountability and, um, and uh, more direct work between the Board of Supervisors and DFCS. But that can happen in many different ways, right? And I saw that there was a, a fiscal implication. Um, so my objective is not to uh, create more um, barriers, but rather to, to do away with them. And so if there's any way that we can work together um, more closely, and I think that what we need is to also have um, stakeholders provide us that level of feedback and because uh, Supervisor Travis and myself are heading a ad hoc process. Um, we know that we are going to engage stakeholders, right? That was just natural for us to want to do. I, I think we do that as policymakers on an ongoing basis throughout the whole year. When you write policy, you want to figure out what's going to work on the ground so those who oppose what you're going to propose and those who support what you are going to propose and so that you can figure out a pathway that works for um, almost everybody. And um, and this is what we're, we're hoping to do is to really hear from the folks on the ground. The stakeholders might include DFCS, um, staff from all different levels. It might include um, expert matter, um, subject matter experts, um, folks who represent different educational institutions, folks who represent the different departments within our own um, system. And with, with all of that feedback, what we're hoping to gather is, is hopefully a, a process that can allow us for higher a level of accountability in place of removing DFCS from the system. Um, and so that, that is what I'm hoping to accomplish. Um, but before we move forward, before we make a decision, I, I want to hear from those stakeholders and that's the purpose of, of this um, memo. Um, I'd also like to learn a little bit more about what LA County is doing, what kind of accountability did they, are they, have they been able to accomplish by removing DFCS from the system? And I know their systems are quite different from ours. They're obviously, they're much bigger than we are. Um, but the one thing that we have in common is that we had a child who died um, under our watch. And, and hopefully, it, for us, it's the last child that, 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 um, that we lose this way. And so we have to figure out, what, based on what we have in common, and which is something that I think we need to ensure that doesn't happen again, that we learn from their lessons. And so that's the last um, item on B3, which is to ask the administration to come back um, and include further information and analysis on whether the decision to structure DFCS has created greater accountability. Uh, for children and families, and so we can learn from the one other county that is doing uh, or, or doing something really different other than the 57 counties. Um, so th that is my motion, is to move the recommended action um, within uh, the report, the legislative file that Supervisor Chavez and I have authored today, um, which also includes returning back, um, I think by fall, of 2024 um, in the quarterly report. I will second that, and then I'd like to make a few comments and ask some questions. Is that okay? Of course. Okay. Supervisor Rennes, you were finished. Yes. I thought, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I do want to thank all the folks who came to, to speak, and I want to just uh, follow up on a couple of issues that were raised. Uh, but James, if I could just start um, start with you. 
could you talk specifically, if you know, uh, to date, how the process that's being used internal to, to DFCS now as, as reviews and changes are occurring, um, how, but what is the internal process on the work streams that are internal, separate of the ad hoc committee, but what are the internal processes that are being used? How are external stakeholders uh, being engaged? And then, candidly, what I'm really trying to understand is under what terms and conditions are new policies coming forward? How is that communication working both internally and with the public? Sure, I can speak to some of that. Uh, more details would um, need to come from the, the department about exactly who, who all is involved um, and is something that certainly can be provided to the board. Um, but within the department, um, as was alluded to by one of the, by one of the speakers, uh, Rico from SEIU, there, I know that the department leadership and agency leadership has been having a number of regular meetings uh, with different stakeholders to discuss uh, policy changes, practice changes, um, as well as um, assessments, uh, both internal stakeholders within the department, and meaning our employees within the department, but also with other partners across uh, the broader system, including other county departments um, and um, external stakeholders as well, uh, and that those conversations are ongoing. Separate and in addition to that, uh, the uh, DFCS leadership in partnership with the County Council's office is reviewing all of the existing policies to ensure that there is um, internal consistency and that there's compliance with the um, with le legal requirements and where there's a need for updates and corrections. Some of those are being made on an uh, ongoing basis, separate from kind of the broader reform conversations, right? Uh, so that's happening as well. Um, one of the reasons for administrations um, bringing forward um, item 1A uh, is that we feel there's a need also to have in addition to those conversations some additional external resources to support and inform what's happening now. Uh, and I think that it's, you know, we heard, as we heard from some of the speakers today, uh, there's definitely many folks who are interested in helping engage in those efforts mm -hmm. deeper and further, uh, and I think that is a good thing and a positive thing. I do think, though, that there is, uh, in, in some cases, a few of these entities, as was referenced by one of the speakers, are some existing folks that, are, that have been working with the department, um, uh, or existing entities, um, and there's a need to, I think, continue that work uh, forward, even if we expand on, iterate, add to, modify uh, the list of people involved and engaged. So um, that's a long way of saying it's being looked at by in multiple angles, in multiple ways, uh, and that from our perspective, uh, from the county administration overall, uh, a need to ensure that uh, we have some additional external expertise to, to have full confidence that review is thorough, ob objective, and complete. So um, I, let, me, let me just uh, make a couple of observations, and I, I also am really interested in getting my colleagues' feedback on, on my thinking about this. I think one of the challenges is that the, there's a lot of activity happening, and there's no central place that people can look and say, okay, um, issue X is being discussed, here's the direction that is internally being taken uh, on issues that are within the purview of the director or the CEO, and here's when we're gonna see the results of those changes. So what it feels like to outsiders is they're reading a policy that's been changed or something that's been removed from a website, and all of a sudden they're saying, well, when did that happen? who's responsible for that, and then what are the implications of that for me as an employee, or me as an advocate, or me as a parent? And so what I would like to request is that there be a, a really clear um, work plan that really does share what's the body of work being discussed, how's that work being analyzed, and then what's the outcome, 
and then that that's regularly published both on, not just on the website, but the way we would any other work plan with something that's this significant. Now I recognize this is extraordinarily complex, and that's actually the reason this is more important than when we're constructing a building or developing a new, a new program, because I think absent that, it, it is creating a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of doubt, and frankly, there, there are folks who feel like they have a particular area of expertise or interest that they want to be uh, participating in, and there's really no way to understand how to do that. So I think that's kind of job one, is you've got multiple work streams, you've got multiple teams working on them. What's the team? What's the work stream? When is it going to become public? And who who is the decider, for lack of a better uh, a better word about the, the particular body of work. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you feel like through the chair that's? Yes, we can definitely do that. Okay. And then and then here's my second point, and I, I just really wanted to follow up and, and thank um, Supervisor Arenas uh, for really taking the lead on the, on the response, and that is that um, I want to be clear that I think one of the ways to really engage our stakeholders is also to um, engage them around who has the area of expertise to help us solve a particular problem. And why I think that's important, and I think as we're figuring out the ad hoc process, I think one of the, I know one of the areas that, um, that Supervisor Arenas and I are really committed to is making sure that we have stakeholder feedback in a way that also includes, here's the gap, here's the area we'd like to look at, and and without predetermining, because that's obviously not our role, but like listening to the public to say, well, we think this person has an area of expertise and we'd like to include them in this conversation, either a, a paid um, uh, consultant or, or somebody in the community. And as you heard, we have a lot of people here who have different parts of the system that they know very well that we want to be able to engage. I, I say that because I, I recognize that we gave you a list, I think, of 32 items as part of the hearing in December, and there are some work streams that are that are under uh, underway and under the purview of the the staff that will be coming back to the board, and then some that are going to be embedded in the ad hoc committee. And and I'm I just wanted to reinforce that I think the point that that. Um, uh, Supervisor Arenas raised that I want to double down on is making sure that for each of the areas that we're diving into that we really are getting the best thinking both from stakeholders but also from um, consulting parties that we want to be able to be very um, specific about what that gap is. That is a long way of getting to the point I'm trying to make which is that on the on the administrative side I hope that you're doing a similar thing with stakeholders because I think the credibility of the work product is in large part going to be going to rest on who it is that we invite in to give us feedback on different parts of the system. Mm -hmm. Does that, does Absolutely. that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you. And then I, I wanted to um, perhaps just acknowledge and maybe ask um, a question of, you know, and I, at the risk of inviting Amanda, and I know Katie's on the phone, and and Fred and Pa, thank you all for being here, and Amanda, um, and of course Rico. I, I am really very interested in how the issues that are needing to be tackled are being shared uh, also with the board, and I, I just wanna give you one example. The child, um, the, the child um, uh, advocacy hotline, um, or I mean, I'm sorry, child abuse hotline, and you know, not to bring up terrible, painful experiences, but Supervisor Simidian and I, I, when we got here, I forgot what the percentage of phone calls being answered was, but it was in the 60s. It was 59, um, as Joe's reminding me, and I know we worked really hard to move it all the way up um, to where it is today. What I'm concerned about, though, is, is hearing uh, Pa say that the, that delta in the time that we're taking a call from when the investigation or the uh, we're sending out somebody to do an investigation, that 15-day timeline is of significant concern. And so there, there are two questions that I want to ask that get resolved and get to the board um, sooner rather than later. One is what the um, CAN um, call 
um, capture rate is, what that CAN Center's rate of, of, of uh, live phone calls and then taking uh, information. And I do want to understand what the delta is between when we take a call and we've sent someone out to go um, investigate the, the, um, the, the claims that we're getting. And I'm not sure where that is on the work plan because frankly, the, the work plan's so internal, I can't look at it and say, great, you're already looking at that. I have no idea if that's the case. Could you speak to that or is there somebody from the staff who can answer that question? So I know there was a report specific to the CAN Center and calls at the last quarterly meeting and what we can do is make sure we look at that as, uh, in relation to the questions that you just asked and have that data updated and provided to the board off agenda so you can get that sooner than the next quarterly report. That would be ideal and I, I do um, wanna also say again not knowing what the internal process is, but if there, if there's, if as part of the internal process we can get eyes on that problem as soon as possible, because what there, there are two things that should come to the board. One is the, the factual data that says here's how many calls we're getting, here's who's getting responded to, here's how quickly we're getting folks out. Um, but the second part of that goes back to how we tried to fix this in the first place, and it required an investment in technology a new structure in the uh, scheduling, an addition of um, appropriate staff people to take the calls and to manage that system. Um, and the second part of that was that the improvement, the technological improvement should have resulted in us actually having the ability to send people out even, even sooner. So I, I, I say all that because if that's already an internal work stream, when we receive the report, I'd want to know that that's an internal work stream and that folks are looking at it and who our partners are, both our stakeholders, some of them in the room, and I hope always our line staff and our bargaining units, but also if there's an expert. Um, because, again, not to, um, not to, not just to bring this up because Supervisor Samadian and I worked on it for a very long time, but one of the challenges we had at the time was even getting an expert on board that could help us analyze our system, believe it or not. Like I think, I think frankly, our offices found our external expert. So, so I, again, I don't know where it is in process, but I'd like to make sure that any report that comes to us, we've gotten some feedback from stakeholders, line staff, you know, the folks that are actually doing the work. Is that possible to do as it comes back to us? We, we definitely can do that, and I, I think it's part of the plan part of the package of items that's on the quarterly report schedule, so. I agree, I agree, I think that's the case. I just, I think this is new, I mean not, I think this is new information that I wanna make sure we have the ability, again, relative to the work plan to dive on things where we think there may, could be an emergency need. I'm gonna stop and see if any of my colleagues have any comments or questions. Thank you both. Um, I, I know that we all share the goal of having a child welfare system that prioritizes child safety and best meets the, need, the needs of children and families. I wanna thank both supervisors Arenas and Chavez for your dedication to this policy area and leading the county in examining potential policy and system improvements. I also wanna thank administration and all of the community members, public speakers, system partners, and expert stakeholders who have already shared their insights and really um, helped me to think very critically about uh, this system. Uh, I believe there are policies and practices, certainly, that need to be improved. Uh, and I agree, uh, particularly Supervisor Chavez, with, with your sentiment that this work needs to be centralized. We need to know what is happening and we need to know who's accountable uh, for every piece of the system. I, I don't think that direction is mutually exclusive um, from engaging uh, additional external, um, external experts. I did find administration's recommendations both to appoint a deputy county executive to oversee uh, the DFCS and to engage with external experts to conduct a holistic review of policies and practices um, in addition to, um, uh, to be, sorry, to be compelling. Um, I don't, I, I think that all of this can happen at the same time. I don't want to delay on that part, so I would ask the maker and the seconder of the motion to include this, um, this recommendation in the direction. To me, it makes sense both for the ad hoc committee members uh, and for county administration to bring in experts that they think would be most useful to help think through this.
So I, I think, um, I, I know the maker of the motion as the seconder, what I would say is I, I think as long as we're getting stakeholder feedback about the experts, that's really the, the point here, that, we're, that we are engaging folks to help us think help us understand who they think are credible in these areas. So I don't I think that's I think that's fine. These aren't mutually exclusive. The yes. the state stakeholders can make recommendations, administration can also look to experts if there's discussion about a, any stakeholder having concern with a particular expert, it would be very valuable for them to raise that. I don't want it to preemptively preclude um, bringing on an expert that that administration would would believe to be valuable. Well, let me let me contribute to that because I think that there um, on the list that that was presented to us there's Laura Garnett mm -hmm. so she's a probation she was former chief of probation mm -hmm. and from what I understand she doesn't have the the kind of expertise um, in, in to to make I think that kind of deep review of a Department of Family and Children's Services, she'll be seeing it from the eyes of a former probation officer and, and, and leader. Um, and so I do think that there is an opportunity for stakeholders to provide um, a list or at least some feedback of experts in the same way that I think, you know, I heard Supervisor Chavez say that Supervisor Simidian and her had to contribute to, the, uh, to actually securing an expert in the area because there wasn't, or, or at least uh, there was a difficult time in trying to secure one. And I think there's some, some just natural uh, tendency as, as human beings because systems don't move themselves, humans mu move these systems or don't move the systems. And so I think it's really important for us to have a natural check and balance. And, um, and while some folks may feel very comfortable with, with uh, and I, I particularly know uh, Laura Garnett, I, I just don't think that, uh, for me, I don't think she would be appropriate on, on the list. So I appreciate the specificity. Yeah. Um, I think that makes the conversation more clear to me. And, and James, I wonder if, if you would like to offer, um, uh, if you feel it's appropriate, why um, you think uh, former Chief Garnett would be a good fit for this role and um, whether that's something that that should be hashed out now or, or can be um, taken offline? Um, sure, I can offer some thoughts. Um, so first I would just say I think um, from our perspective um, there's no intention to be exclusive. In other words, if there's other folks who make sense to be involved, I think we would very much welcome that. Um, and I do think there are other um, others, other entities as well as other individuals who could really add value, especially on certain facets of, of analysis. Um, from our perspective regarding uh, former uh, Chief of Probation, Laura Garnett, uh, she is an individual who, I, who has a very strong reputation in this community, um, has, did incredible work on the juvenile uh, justice side in probation, um, has a familiarity with uh, um, the broader system, including the past partnerships with probation and DFCS, and would certainly is not a be-all, end-all, and it wasn't presented as such in our report, uh, but but is a, a voice that we believe would be able to give county administration and the board uh, an independent take on some pieces of this as part of a broader assessment. And I know that the several board members who have um, uh, served here uh, during her tenure as chief probation officer, I'm sure have their uh, have had their own interactions um, with her, um, but I think would agree that she certainly has independence uh, and an independent perspective that she could offer. Is that for me to? respond to? to? To just respond to whether or not you'll, you'll include well, the additional direction in your memo, right. in your motion. L listen, it, it, the reason that I have this as a feedback is because I, I am not an expert in the child welfare system. Um, you know, my background is in um, human development and early childhood, um, but I've yet to say that 
child welfare system is uh, is an expertise that I hold, a master's in public administration, yet I still wouldn't say that I'm an expert in the child welfare system because those um, codes are very specific and the, the reforms over the years that have been, um, that have grown the system to where it is now is held by a lot of our social workers, is held by a lot of our experts in the, in the area um, that specifically work within that child welfare system. And so, uh, you know, my, my, I'm gonna, another example, my sister, <laughs> Now her bachelor's is in is in, is in uh, the the justice system, and her and her master's is in that same so area. I think but I can help you. So, but but I wouldn't want her to come in and and evaluate. Right. It so just it, it doesn't make sense to me. I I am happy. I don't want to make this a referendum on on Chief Garnett. Um, yeah, I, and it's I do. specific so specific. So I her. no that let me no, let me finish. It isn't. So uh, I don't I don't think we. We should continue this, but I, I am c very comfortable saying that if there is a proposed expert that you're not comfortable with, that um, that the stakeholders should provide feedback that you should meet with, and if it's not someone someone's advice that you think is appropriate or um, or relevant to this work, then then they won't. Well, that proceed. is exactly what is on our memo okay. is is to get that. I'm just trying to gracefully back, back yes, it up now. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, but let me ask uh, uh, this as well, um, and, and this may be part of your motion already too. But as you're as you're thinking about um, stakeholders and, and groups to um, involve, just wondering if if. Um, you're considering the Dependency Advocacy Center. Of course, I know Child Advocates um, is part of this, and Legal Ad Advocates for Children and Youth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Then I am uh, well prepared and comfortable to support your motion as it is. Thank you for talking that through with me. Do we have any other comments? We have one. Yeah, Supervisor Smidian. Just a question. After the back and forth, where did the motion end up about the simultaneity, if that's a word, of the uh, motion made by Supervisors Arenas and Chavez and the direction to have the external review. Is that, are they, I thought your motion or your request for incorporation was to do two things at once. Yes. And I'm trying to make uh, clear for myself whether that is now the basis of the motion. Yes. Still external, yes, but because we recognize, but pursuant I mean, to or in in connection with stakeholder review and feedback. Got it. Thank yes. you very much. Okay, um, I inadvertently, I've, I mean, we're going to hear from one more public speaker. This was my error in not being more clear. I've sort of morphed recently to close all public comment when the first speaker in chambers begins speaking because we've still been having management issues with. Um, determining one amount of time for public speakers based on the number when we begin and then um, often a good deal more on on Zoom. So I do want to make sure going forward that everyone knows that the speaker queue will close when the first speaker in person begins speaking so that we know the total number of speakers both in chambers and on Zoom. And I'll, I'll reiterate that uh, a number of times since, um, the, since I guess it, it is it is new. Um, so for the speaker who did not hear that announcement and was um, uh, was not able to log on quite so quickly, let's hear that speaker, please, and then we'll vote. Thank you. We'll hear from Steve Eckert for two minutes. Please accept the unmute. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hello, honorable uh, members of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for um, including my, my speaking. Um, Steve Eckert, I'm CEO of Allen Rock Counseling Center. I appreciate and support the active attention currently on services for high-risk children and families served by DFCS. As you may know, Allen Rock Counseling Center provides a wide variety of services for Santa Clara uh, children, youth, and families, including behavioral health, but also two programs uh, within DFCS, the Parent Advocates Program our staff or peers, parents who have been in the DFCS system, who support current parents in the DFCS system, 
and also cultural brokers, staff who work alongside social workers who come from the same culture as the clients. For the last couple of years up until recently, referrals from DFCS into these programs were low compared to the years before for the Parent Advocates Program. The decrease in referrals are partly due to COVID, but also uh, as a result of more cases becoming voluntary. High-risk families need consistent court intervention and monitoring, i.e. diversion, to ensure, the, to ensure the safety of their children. It's essential. Um, since the return of increased court involvement, our caseloads are full, and parents are generally appreciative and cooperative with our services. One challenge is the turnover in, uh, um, in the social workers, um, our colleagues there. Um, we are definitely willing and interested in helping. Um, we appreciate the partnership we have with our DFCS uh, colleagues and are honored to work with the parents and children that we serve. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. We have a motion by Arenas and a second by Chavez. Let's vote on this item, please. I do have a couple more comments and so questions. So sorry, I didn't see I the light. Go right ahead. Um, for the county executive uh, on the matter of what I'll call external evaluators, um, I think one of the earlier topics we had today raised the uh, question which is how can uh, such a structure be organized to provide the greatest possible assurance of the quote objectivity of the external evaluators uh, you know I think there's a uh, always going to be a concern on the part of some that you know whoever hires the or selects the external evaluators is uh, in some way uh, capable of calling the shots or predetermining the outcome, so on and so forth. And you, you, you've hinted at this a little in the memo, but if you could speak a little more directly to, I just, I'd sort of like to make sure we anticipate that possibility and that uh, whatever structure is in place uh, addresses it proactively. Sure, I, I think the, the response is multifaceted. One is by having multiple folks and entities engaged, you, I think, have greater confidence that there's different people with different lenses, certainly, because every person with whatever background or every organization or entity with whatever background certainly brings particular perspectives or lenses or expertise in particular facets of what is um, complex uh, work and a system that has multiple touch points, several of which we've touched on today, uh, but having multiple um, entities engaged and involved, I think is helpful. And of course, this is all additive to um, everything that has been discussed up to date, including the folks at uh, CDSS and including all of the existing internal stakeholder groups and evaluations. Uh, so that's one piece. I think a second piece um, is, is in uh, identifying the yeah, we, and again, this was meant to be an inclusive, not exclusive list, but uh, the part of the thought in the, um, in, in the list that we did bring forward are entities that have, um, are coming from a place of the ability to be pretty independent. So for example, two entities that work with the state and work with counties across the state, uh, so don't have a, any particular, um, um, you know, they've, they've been engaged certainly in different ways in our county, just like they have in all counties in California, but they have kind of that statewide partnership perspective and ongoing relationship with the, with the state department as well. Um, and with the two individuals noted, folks, these are folks who uh, have long careers in public service but are retired. Um, and so, you know, we'll come at this work from that perspective of having uh, not just a financial independence, but also um, coming at this from a project perspective as opposed to ongoing, um, you know, continued employment, right? So that's some of the thinking. Those are some of the facets. There are others as well. But again, in inclusive, not exclusive. I would just uh, encourage the administration in 
comparing the contract documents, whether for individuals or organizations, to look for the possibility to incorporate language that specifically calls out the independence or objectivity. I mean, these are all going to be matters of professional judgment, I understand that, but that calls out the, um, the guarantee of independence to the extent you can guarantee such a thing. Uh, uh, of of the folks, I just I think anything anything that can be done along the way to provide greater assurance that there is in fact real independence of thought, but also to provide greater assurance to the public that there is independence of thought, will stand us in good stead, uh, both in terms of the actual product and the acceptance of that product when the time comes. Then, um, speaking of outside reports, uh, reviews and reports, uh, where are we, if I may ask through the chair, Ms. Williams, with the request we've made of the California Department of Social Services for some copy, uh, redacted or otherwise, uh, in the Phoenix Castro case? of the uh, report in the Phoenix Castro case. Excuse so me. CDSS itself hasn't changed its position, uh, but we've uh, been working with county council and the board. Uh, it should be getting an update relatively soon uh, regarding additional steps on that as requested previously by the board. So that will be uh, forthcoming soon to the board. Presumably, thank you, presumably um, CDSS takes some guidance or direction from the governor's office in the structure of things, yes? Yes. So presumably the governor's office could appropriately weigh in and indicate the need for some form of the report to be made available? Yes. Am I remembering correctly that it is section 827 of the Welfare and Institutions Code that governs issues of confidentiality in these matters? Yes, that's the, there are a few others, but that's the core provision that governs confidentiality of juvenile records, of which this is, this is one. And does Section 827 have a remedy if the materials are not available or are, are withheld due to confidentiality concerns? It, it does, and there's another facet which is, um, Generally speaking, uh, subject to certain limited redactions, case file related information associated with uh, a child fatality are made available to the public. Uh, in this case, uh, we sought to invoke that provision with CDSS um, and um, CDSS uh, indicated that that wasn't applicable here, presumably because there's commingled information associated with still living siblings. Um, but more on this point will be forthcoming from county council soon. Okay, I will, I will not pursue this at much greater length than understanding that and the um, need to craft an appropriate and specific response in an appropriate document to be shared in an appropriate way uh, at an appropriate time. I will, however, say, um, I gather that there may be some legal recourse to the refusal, yes? Yes. Okay, I'll just indicate as one member of the board, I think we should be considering any and all options. And I wanna revisit through the chair, colleagues, the conversation we had previously um, in which I expressed my frustration and disappointment that the, state has continued to decline to share the report. And um, the, my, my reasoning here is pretty straightforward. Uh, I believe through the chair to either Mr. Williams or Mr. Lepresti that the relationship here is that the California Department of Social Services has some oversight authority over our own local Department of uh, Family and Children's Services, yes? It does, and is, and is quite comprehensive in its authority. And presumably as a result of that oversight, 
they weigh in with observations in their report, and I say presumably because I haven't seen it, um, they weigh in with observations in their report when there is a tragic incident with some description and assessment of responsibility and uh, presumably provide some indication as to whether or not that was a human error, a judgment call that was tragically wrong or a systemic uh, flaw, that that's what we would look for, yes? I would certainly hope so. Just to be clear, I haven't seen the report either, so I don't know what's in it. Thank you. But you anticipated, that would be my hope. Forgive me, I didn't mean to talk over you. You anticipated one of my next questions, which was, um, so uh, we've discussed previously that the, the report um, is not available to the Board of Supervisors because the because of the confidentiality in the report, which I understand. There is personal confidential information there, which presumably could be redacted, but apparently the state has made the judgment uh, that that's not a path they want to take. And you've just indicated, as I understand it, that you have not um, had a chance to see it because it's also confidential as to you? That's correct, for the same reason. And and who is the highest level if I, and. Um, I'm sorry for peppering you with questions, Mr. Williams. I, I, the, the, I, I don't mean to take your deposition here. I'm just trying to understand how this works. Who is your who is the highest level person in our county who is able to see that given the confidentiality status? Yeah, g given the direction from CDSS that accompanied the report, it it can't uh, be reviewed above the social services agency level. So that would be the director of the social services agency. Whose name again is Dan Little. Dan Little. And Mr. Little is supervised by whom? By Greta. Our chief operating officer. Correct. So I think I know the answer, but I just want to get all this he out He has here. not seen the report either. Thank you. That was my question. <laughs> you saw it coming. So Ms. Hansen, you've not seen the report either. It, and it's deemed confidential That's as correct. to you. Okay. So uh, colleagues, forgive me for revisiting the issue that we talked about the last time, but I just I sort of want to, as we anticipate next possible steps, I want to just be clear. And, and this is the source of my frustration, and I want to be really clear for, for board colleagues and for staff and for the public. This is not about turf. It's not about power. It's not about authority. It, it, how our organization or the state can say, this is a human tragedy, and we have to do everything in our power to make sure it doesn't happen again. Please take the necessary steps to make sure that this never happens again if it is humanly possible to prevent it and then say, however, the chief operating officer, the chief executive officer, and the five policymakers for the organization who have that responsibility do not have the authority to review the document which contains the state's assessment of what went wrong and why. Uh, it just, it's, I'm, I'm just continuing to be baffled and frustrated that that's the posture of the state. So um, I, I did want to just revisit this issue, uh, and I gather from your earlier comments, Mr. Williams, that either you or county council or both will be sending us a document fairly soon. Could I ask what the timeline for that is? Yes, so before uh, county council weighs in, I just did want to say I, um, I agree with your concerns, um, and that's why We've pushed for a, a minimum some redacted version of the report because I don't, again, haven't seen it, but don't know why it couldn't be redacted to remove whatever portions may, be, may still be confidential under 827. Um, and I uh, think that in consultation with county council, there's a pathway uh, to proceed, and I'll let county council respond on the timeline. Uh, we'll have an off-agenda memo to the board uh, likely this week, Supervisor. Thank you. I look forward to that. All right. Uh, Supervisor Lee, and then we'll go to a uh, vote. <clears throat> Thank you, President Ellenberg. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, uh, 
do say that I, I completely echo the concerns and the frustration of my colleague, the Supervisor Smithian. Uh, it really doesn't make sense. How can we fix something that we don't know what needs to be fixed when the report is kept from us? So some of the concerns of confidentiality, I get it, but the fact that we cannot even get a redacted version, that doesn't make any sense. So echoing that. Uh, also want to really thank my colleagues, who are Renas and Chavez, for spearheading these important efforts, asking very difficult questions to provide much closer oversight of the, what the challenges that DFCS is facing and those resulting with many tragic consequences when our system has these gaping holes. Um, there's a phrase that's been said that when justice delayed, it's justice denied. What we have here is we have people crying for help. And as one of the early speakers has mentioned, uh, when the phone calls are not being answered and when the referrals are like two weeks late, delayed, uh, and for our most vulnerable of the vulnerables, we're talking about children of parents who couldn't take care of their kids, services delayed is services denied. And so I just want to make sure that this is clearly an item that all five of us here are extremely concerned. Um, so I, I want to thank my colleagues for trying to do everything that we can, making those no stones unturned here, uh, and uh, and I hope that we could, through all these processes, through oversight and you know experts coming in, stakeholders coming in who works on this on day to day basis, that they do get enough people and the resources so that they could actually properly do their jobs. Uh, this is a tough one, and uh, I, I, I thank my colleagues for leading these efforts, and you definitely have my support moving forward to make sure we get to the bottom of this. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion by Arenas and a second by Chavez. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Ch Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Smidian, and I. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with five. Thank you so much. Uh, looking at my agenda. I believe we have two items remaining, 15 and 17. Is that what you have as well? It is. All right. Item 15 is the South County Children's Advocacy Center report. like us to just start talking? <laughs> That's a great idea, James. Okay, great. Maybe introduce <laughs> yourself first. I was, I was waiting for something to happen. Um, I'm James Gibbett Shapiro from uh, the DA's office, and uh, here with me are some esteemed colleagues. I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we have a brief report, and then we'll go to your questions. Sounds good. Hello, I'm Marlene Stern, Medical Director of the Medical Clinic at the Children's Advocacy Center. Good afternoon, uh, Deputy County Executive Casey Halkin. Good afternoon, Celine Hill, Health Center Manager for Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. So we have, um, with your great help and assistance and the work of lots of different county departments, um, been moving forward quickly to build a South County Children's Advocacy Center at the location of the Morgan Hill Clinic of Valley Healthcare. FAF has been doing some very detailed work to make a draft floor plan. You all approved uh, funds for an architect and we've been working with FAF and procurement to get that work started as quickly as possible in conjunction with um, uh, work that we're um, hoping is gonna be expedited as far as both the recruitment and retention of the uh, company that's gonna be doing the construction. So all of these things are happening together to try to move this on an expedited time frame per your directions. And I think I will end there and ask for your questions. All right, let's go first to public comment. Uh, again, if there are speakers in the chamber, you should have a yellow card handed in. Uh, if not yet, they're over there on the back table. If you're on Zoom and intending to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. We will close the speaking queue for all speakers when the first speaker in chamber begins. Jess, what do we have? 
holding at one on Zoom. And no one in chambers. Correct. All right, then we will hear one speaker, please. Our speaker online is resident. You'll have two minutes. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, um, before I um, um, make public comment on this item, I just wanted to ask a general question about public comment. And that is that on the previous item, I had my hand raised uh, at the start before you guys closed the queue. And I just had a, a general question about to Mr. Williams. It, that doesn't affect the vote or anything, just a general question. I was wondering if I could ask that question before I make public comment, just to be fair, to give me the public comment. Is that okay, Ms. Uh, President Allenberger? We're unable to accommodate that, but happy for you to send your question in an email and continue with your public comment now. Okay, so um, you know, a, a lot of times uh, there there are conflicts of interest, and I didn't see anything about that in the report. I know it's about building, but it's also about visions moving forward. And um, just a question for the presenters. I mean, people are human beings, you know, they get influenced, whether they know it or not, on taking action or not taking action. And um, I was just wondering for any of the presenters or perhaps for Mr. Lopresti, what does the county do? Like if there is a conflict of interest in evaluating a child in the Child Advocacy Center, how do you guys address that? How do you guys mitigate conflicts of interest? And any of the presenters or Mr. Lopresti, I'd, I'd love to hear an answer to that. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Um, let, let's go to uh, my colleagues. And I see again, Supervisor Arena Sven Chavez. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to thank everybody um, for all the work that you're doing. I know this thing doesn't allow for us to see each other. We have to agree, down or up? Yeah, up, okay, always up. <laughs> so I just wanna thank you for all the work that you're doing behind the scenes to make sure that the CAC um, moves forward and um, that our South County um, folks are taking advantage of all the support services that are uh, rendered under the roof of CAC. Um, first and foremost, I just wanna ask if there's anything that you think um, that the board can do to help expedite the process. Is there anything that you um, have identified so far uh, in preparing the space um, uh, that needs any any additional support on? Um, and then lastly, if you can help us with a kind of a, in the future, maybe a detailed timeline of the project milestones. I know that we have an interim process in, in, um, so that nobody is left um, behind in South County, um, but there's nothing like having um, you know, your, your CAC, and I got to see where w it's going to be, but I know that it, from just looking at the location and then having those doors open, there's some plenty of time. Um, so I wanted to get a little bit more from you. Sure, I'll start and then I see that Deputy County Executive Halcone also has her line on. So um, we um, did receive a s proposed schedule um, from uh, fleets and facilities about how this would go if it was a normal procedure. And we didn't include that in the ledge file because it was unacceptable. It was uh, too slow of a procedure. And um, I think that often um, our normal procedures are are very deliberative for lots of good reasons, but um, we have an urgent need right now, and with your direction, we've been moving to expedite that timetable. So when we come back, we'll have a, a better timetable for you than the one that we did not include in this legislative file because it was unacceptable. And if I may, um, just to kind of add to what um, Assistant District Attorney Gibbon Shapiro was sharing, part of the work, I think, of this multidisciplinary team is working together in tandem. So. To move the timelines ahead, we're working um, really simultaneously with County Council on sole source, with procurement, with FAF. We are getting recommendations on the architect with the goal of being able to utilize an architect and a construction company at the same time to help fast track those designs, which is cost effective if they can work together. It leads to less change orders and also helps to mitigate delay. And so that's something that we're doing together um, with 
partnership again at FAF, County Council Procurement, and of course our leadership um, with the administration and also with the district attorney's office and with uh, Valley Medical Center as well. So it's definitely something we're working together on and um, as James said, something we hoping to have an updated timeline for you in our next report. And I will add that um, uh, Director Draper and Director Hada um, in uh, most recent meeting have been very supportive of an expedited timeline and achieving the goals that Deputy County Executive Halcon laid out. Thank you, and, and, and thank you for um, not including that timeline so none of us would gasp <laughs> over here um, in horror <laughs> um, and expect really good news knowing that all of you are working behind the scenes in order to get this through, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to, um, actually this is, this is more for our, um, for this is for James. Um, y one, one of the things that I heard back from, um, from folks is that, uh, and, and that I wanted to get to the bottom of it, so I'll bring it up here, is that uh, DFCS um, uh, is not responding to calls at the CAC. Um, and so I wanted to know um, what is the role of DFCS, of the social workers, and how often are they um, meeting with folks and participating in any of the meetings that are happening under the CAC? And let me just say this, is none of the folks that are sitting here, they're not the ones who shared this with me. So I, I don't know um, how often they're meeting with folks and the specifics to the, the question that you asked, but we can provide that to you off agenda in short order. Okay, wonderful. I'm, I was really concerned um, because it seemed like um, the, the, some of the court orders in order to um, interview the child were being conducted um, by the district attorney's office and not by um, DFCS because they just weren't present and were not responding simultaneously with them. So I appreciate that. Um, so I'll put, uh, I don't have to put that on the motion since there's already You've already agreed to that, um, but I will um, make a motion to receive the report. Second. Thank you. And then I'll um, I'll go ahead and um, weigh in. Th so thank you. I think this is very exciting work. I know it is. There's um, a one request that I would like to make, and that is um, well two actually. And I'm going to add ask that the maker of the motion consider these um, to be included. Uh, one is that I, I think it would be really valuable to get a work plan as soon as one can be um, developed that really does show what the milestones are in the development of the physical infrastructure, but also the program development. I'm very mindful that you have raised with us a concern over being able to hire the appropriate staff and train them. And so I think there's a, uh, that's why I would like to see physical infrastructure and programmatic infrastructure separately as part of the motion. Accepted. Thank you. And then here's, here's my, my uh, request, and I'd love to get your feedback on how to do this. We all, and you specifically, have learned an awful lot about running a child advocacy center. And I am very interested in understanding how what we've learned in the San Jose um, location, how that will how that will impact the program development in the South County, um, you know, uh, CAC. My first answer to that is that one of the things that um, we didn't plan for as well as we should have in the beginning was building in from the get go behavioral health services into our model, and so as we added those on to our CAC in San Jose, because it wasn't part of the original design, we had to figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that uh, we have a clear behavioral, behavioral health partners and behavioral health integrated into the plan is, is how we're gonna learn that lesson. Um, I think that lots of other things that we're gonna be doing are just trying to replicate the success of our San Jose CAC, and there's many, many successes, but I think that's the main um, thing in my mind that we can improve upon. 
So um, I, I think that's really helpful. I, I would like to see as the as the um, South County CAC comes online, that we're calling out what we've learned and what the changes are. In part, first of all, I really want the organization to feel free to learn and not that not be a point of shame, but it's actually a celebration that we invested in, a, in, a, in something that we were borrowing an idea from someone else and then we added our own flavor to it. And now it's actually probably pretty different than most of the facilities across the country in part because of resources and culture and all those things. So I, I think um, as often as possible, and really, James, I'm, this is more directed towards you, that I think we ha I would request and recommend that we build in a section in our, in our um, reports, especially where we have some learnings, what we learned. And and I think that would help the organization get more comfortable with that as a practice of all of our institutions. So that, that's one issue. I, I would just add two observations from an outside, outside perspective that I would want to recommend. First is that I was surprised, frankly, how um, when the CAC came on board, how um, important it was to make sure that all of our partners, but in particular the police agencies, mm -hmm. were very familiar with the facility, what happens there, what their role is, how, how to create a high level of comfort. And even where we had an ex incredibly strong partnership with a city like San Jose and some of our other cities, having them feel comfortable coming to the CAC, making sure that children arrived at the CAC, that took some some doing. And I think part of that is just, it's, it's new. And so I would like to see us start the education process early with a lot more input from our public safety entities, even in the design of the facility. Last time that really happened with some partners, but really the DA, because you're a law enforcement, you're the law enforcement leader, that, that imprimatur got put on by you, but I think it really needs to get Morgan Hill, the sheriffs, and the Gilroy um, Police Department's imprimatur on it in a very meaningful way. So that, that would be my first request. The second is that even though we're one, um, and we're working really hard to be a health system, we're still systems in my observation, and, and I think that's, you know, especially as it's, it's a larger system now, that that we also treat our health partners, whether they're um, County of Santa Clara, Kaiser, the clinics in the area to know what that facility is and that they get the, their tours and their experiences are really engaged early. I know um, uh, that uh, Dr. Stroom, you have a, an incredible um, reputation with a lot of these folks, so I think you know, having you lead those, but but I think getting that buy-in really early will help a lot, particularly as we're trying to get people who are mandated reporters to, in fact, report and know that there's a safe way for them to do that in an environment that a child will get the support that, and their family will get the support they need. So those would be my, my two observations from what we just experienced. Um, and then my last point is that I, I do still think we have an area an area of improvement relative to um, the the interview system and process. And I really um, I want to just say to my colleagues that I, I had this an opportunity to get some more information from um, from James uh, Gibbon Shapiro, which I really appreciated. And I think it relates to the other side of the question that uh, Supervisor Arana uh, raised about like. You know who's accessing? How are we doing that? Are the social workers present? Are we doing the interviews as quickly as we should be? You know all of that. Um, in in one question, I mean one request I would make is that that which is built into a design issue, that 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 actually speaks to the staffing, which is why I think the programmatic side about staffing, staffing availability, and how quickly we're able to do that is going to be really important because it's both important on the DFCS side, but you know, if we don't have enough interviewers, what do we need to do to make that happen? And if we don't have enough people trained in that skill set, uh, again, for smaller departments, that may be a problem. You know, if we're looking at police agencies as partners, we need to know that now so that we can prepare both budgetarily, but also 
It will enhance your ability to recruit the right partners to engage. So those are some issues that I just wanted to not just put on the record, but also say to all of you, I, I hope those will be considered as the um, work plans come back and we can do some, with some intentionality, you know, really, really make this a very um, core part of the services that we're able to provide in South County. I completely agree with you, and especially on the forensic interviewer point, um, it's going to be crucial that we have forensic interviewers who are going to be very conversant in Spanish, because that's mm -hmm. our main language um, for our victim population in, in South County for most of our child sexual abuse victims. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that there's been a real culture shift in the law enforcement community about the use of professional forensic interviewers since the opening of the CAC. So before the opening of the CAC, there was a real reluctance among detectives to have a professional forensic interviewer be the one to interview a child. But since the opening of the CAC, we found that detectives have seen the value of having someone who does this all the time and has a great ability to talk with kids about these very difficult topics um, and to use them as a resource and view them not as competition, but as a partner. And that has been fantastic, but it also um, highlights the need for more capacity for that going forward. And if I may add, um, I just would like to give some credit also to the program manager of the CAC, Jennifer Putoff, who's here. One of the core tenants of her work has been the certified forensic interviewer training. And so she's worked really diligently with all of our law enforcement partners across the county to increase and enhance their ability and understanding of how to conduct a minimal fact interview in order to get these clients to the CAC, which is the appropriate method. And that has included the Sheriff's Office, Morgan Hill, and Gilroy PD. The outreach to those departments has already started. Um, you know, and I don't think it's a coincidence that many of us that are working at the CAC, myself included, are also going to be working um, more holistically with DFCS as well. So to your point about making sure we have, you know, we have appropriate staffing, that we have appropriate engagement between DFCS and CAC is something we're absolutely gonna be working on and have um, for the last several months and we'll be doing moving forward. I think lessons learned to James's earlier point one item that we learned very quickly, and I think all of us would agree, is that we anticipated we would see around 250 children and families the first year we opened. Um, I think now they're close to 700 per year, and so the number um, has tripled from where we initially expected it. And that is, has required flexibility in staffing, flexibility in the space itself. So that's something that we're building into the design of the South County CAC. So the lessons learned where we can have flexible space if we need to in a year or two, repurpose certain areas in order to meet the needs of the children and families that we're seeing. So we definitely are incorporating those lessons and it's something I think all of us would feel um, very frank in, in sharing in any reports to the board in the future. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. And again, I just, I, I do want to say, I would really embed those into work plans so that we can see that work. And and also, you know, I, my hope is that the, the structure of these is that we've built in the ability to learn in a way that allows us to respond more readily to even the changes that we're seeing. And I, and you know, and I, I, you know, for another day, we can talk more about, about that, but I, I, that's really helpful. Thank you. May I add a comment? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I feel like one of the themes today is efficiency in child protection. Um, I've heard you all talk about how important it is for referrals to be efficient. Um, I, I must add that from where we sit, there are two parts to creating timely safety for children. The first part is removing them from the situation where they've experienced maltreatment. Um, the second part is providing them with a timely medical exam, depending on the type of physical abuse or sexual abuse that they've received. They absolutely should receive care within two days, within a day, sometimes within a few hours. And oftentimes, um, the, b the barrier that we have is that um, our partners have not obtained medical consent. As you probably know, we cannot provide medical evaluations for children at the Spark Clinic without medical consent. And we cannot provide 
forensic evaluations for physical abuse or safe exams for sexual abuse at the CAC without medical consent. I, I would like to ask for your support in making sure that when children are placed in foster care, in addition to the court order to place them in foster care, at the same time that they receive the order for medical consent, and similarly, when children are not in foster care, when they're still in the care of their parents, but there are concerns about maltreatment, we must have a timely order for medical consent, or either signed by the parent or, or a court order from the judge, or we cannot see them. Well, one, um, just as a follow-up to that, you know, we had been working with um, DFCS to ensure that was the case, and one of the one of the programs or work streams there was to make sure that as children were coming into our um, custodial care that we were getting those consents on the front end. And there was um, a portal that was, and I guess James and Greta, I would say this to you, there was a portal that was presumably created that would give us access when a parent was unwilling to give us um, consent so that it was easier to get that consent included, Dr. Stroom. And so what I would just ask is that um, as part of this action that we're taking today, that we get an update on that, um, that process and procedure. And then coupled with that, you know, I, I do want to just lean in and say that this, this also means that um, one of the stakeholders uh, in all of the discussions we're having really are the courts as well. And, you know, as it relates to this body of work, I would be interested in getting feedback from the courts about whether or not they're getting what they need um, in order to make those uh, those decisions. So presumably we have a process in place, but I, I haven't heard an update on it for a while. There is a process in place, but as the person who finds well, I'm an, myself I'm understanding. struggling yeah. with it um, at midnight, um, it, it it's it's not um, consistent. Yeah, and I think that's that's fair, but I think it's something that is. Um, so first of all, thank you for raising it. But second of all, the the point I just want to make to staff is this goes in the category of urgent. It's an urgent problem that needs to be addressed. So interested in getting feedback on that in an off agenda right away about how we're how that's happening now and what the gap is. But I want to make sure we're including the courts because. They've given us feedback that in some instances we're not giving them what they need in order to take a action more directly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Arvinas? Actually, I, I, you just asked for what I was going to ask for, so right. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arvinas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes, thank you, that carries with five. Thank you very much. Um, our, just one second here. Our final uh, item today is item 17 on the Lunar New Year count, County Holiday Report. Supervisor Lee, this was your referral. Are you interested in uh, a report back, or do you want to go right no. to comments or questions? I'm ready for questions. Okay. Um, I'll be happy to start then. <laughs> with the, I show. Um, with should we just hear the public if anybody only speaks? Oh, of course. Close of course. First? Of course. Do we have public speakers on this item? I do have a card for Fo Bui, who was here this morning. Fo, are you still in chambers? And they've left chambers, and I do have two hands up on Zoom. All right. Note that um, when the first speaker begins, the queue will close. So we'll look to see if the number holds at two or if we get a few more speakers. We're up to three and holding. All right. Three and holding. We'll hear uh, from our three speakers, please. Our first speaker is Donald Chan. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Dr. Chan. I'm a resident physician in radiology at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, and I'm a proud member of the Committee of Interns and Residents, uh, SEIU. Uh, I'm here to thank the board and the county executive 
for looking into making Lunar New Year a holiday in Santa Clara County. Uh, more than 40% of the county's residents and more than 30% of the county's employees identify as Asian American and Pacific Islander. Uh, observing the Lunar New Year as a paid county holiday would honor their heritage in a meaningful and equal way. Personally, I would like to spend time with my mother during Lunar New Year. The county already celebrates paid holidays to honor significant events for other groups of people that have contributed to the county and to celebrate our county's diversity, including Juneteenth and Cesar Chavez Day. It would only be fair to recognize Lunar New Year in the same manner for the largest minority group in Santa Clara County. Uh, last year, the Santa Cla Clara County Water District voted to recognize Lunar New Year as a paid holiday. Given the demographics of our county, I believe that uh, Santa Cla Clara County can do the same and take the lead in the state and nationally in recognizing Lunar New Year. I know I'm not the only uh, county worker who feels this way. In support of this effort, 10 unions signed onto a letter calling for a Lunar New Year to be recognized as a paid holiday. This includes uh, the unions of nurses and support staff at the hospital, the firefighters union, the deputy sheriff's association, and the county employees management association. For these reasons, CIR members hope the board will consider making Lunar New Year a paid county holiday. We thank you again for bringing this matter before the board and for making space to publicly acknowledge the contribution of the Asian American community to Santa Clara County. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Mary Hernandez. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, so this is a really big deal for me. I fought really, really hard for this in negotiations. I'm Mary Hernandez, Vice President of SEIU 521. I want to say that I grew up here. I grew up here my entire life and I've watched the Asian community grow here and flourish. And I work with so many Vietnamese Americans um, and I look at them like the silent majority. Like there's so many and they're so quiet about speaking out for things like this. They're, they're a really tight knit community and they're a really big part of our community. And just to see them being acknowledged because this is such a huge holiday for them. The state has already implemented some kind of holiday. I would like to see that holiday be a paid holiday, um, just like any other holiday that we celebrate um, in the county. Again, like I see them as this huge silent majority. And I think that by implementing this holiday and acknowledging all of their hard work and all of their everything that they've brought to this community would just be something that we should have done a long time ago. I'm kind of at a loss as an innovative county and a forward moving county that we're kind of behind in this. But um, in the spirit of what we are, I know that we can pick that up. And I know that we can set a precedent statewide as a county that is recognizing their Asian American community and, and giving them the respect and, and dignity that they all, they all are entitled to as uh, members of our community. Thank you. Thank you. We did have a hand up from Zoom user, but that went down. Last call for that. And that concludes public comment. Thank you, and thank you, Supervisor Lee, uh, for your referral. Uh, Lunar New Year is indeed an important day for our Asian American and Pacific Islander community in Santa Clara County, and it's an opportunity for the broader community to become more aware of the beautiful traditions of our diverse population. I would be very glad to support option A today for the county to observe uh, Lunar New Year as a county holiday and for staff to come back in the future uh, to the board to discuss making this a paid uh, holiday for county employees. Option A mirrors the action of the state um, and I think it's a really exciting opportunity. So as the author of the referral, if you're comfortable recommending option A and picking up the conversation in the future, I would be very glad to second your motion. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank James and your team for bringing back to the board so quickly on this issue, uh, early than the expected dates, which is really nice. Um, and that, uh, given the fact that we are dealing with a $250 million uh, deficit for this next fiscal year, uh, it will be very difficult to add another paid holiday at this time. So I certainly would like to make a motion to move forward with option A, observe the New Year's County holiday just like the state of California. 
Delighted to second. Thank you. Do I have additional comments? Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I think um, I, I think that that you know, Supervisor Lee, you brought this forward, so I'm going to be respectful of the direction that you're offering. This would be it, imp more interesting to me if I knew when this would be considered, reconsidered. When we would go from A to B is my question. I'll ask the yep. county executive who handles the budget. <laughs> I think the, the appropriate time to look at that would be uh, on an annual basis as our budget situation stabilizes. Um, I think that would be an appropriate time frame. So right now we don't know what things will look like for the subsequent year, um, especially given what impacts might come from the state. But I think that's the 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 um, uh, key issue from administration's perspective, uh, and yeah. one that we can continue checking with the board on on an ongoing basis. So I, I'm going to make a, a slightly different recommendation to both the maker and the seconder, and that is again, Otto, this is your 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 train. Um, I actually think um, by budget cycle is a little late, and I would be interested in having this get agendized until it gets resolved at, at mid-year budget. And the reason for that is that I know um, the, the staff starts to look at budget, like we, uh, we vote on the budget in June and they start working on the budget again in August, September, October. Um, and so I, I think that if, if we're able to have this as a discrete discussion in mid-year, um, it would make more sense in terms of being able to plan and, um, you know, for the future, if the maker is comfortable with that. James, any issue regarding the timing to get mid-year? I think we can certainly come back with a, with a report at the subsequent mid-year. Okay. That's all I have. Sure. Thank you. And a seconder. Thank you. Seeing uh, no additional lights, and we've taken public comment, let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Rennes? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with five. And congratulations, uh, Supervisor Lee, on that important recognition. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for, for today's meeting. Thank you to the clerk's office and the Create TV folks and the security dudes and all of the department uh, and staff members that presented today and everyone up on the dais. Have a wonderful Tuesday.